Motivational Radicals broadcast. Just got a text uh, from Skip, you know, and he's uh, he got stuck at, at at the parole office, probation, parole, whatever. So he said he gonna be a minute. That's not. Good. He's dealing with his cure. I keep telling him. He gonna never, ever, ever be an alpha in his soul. Involved with his damn kid. Who does that? Anyway, welcome to the Rational Radical Radicals broadcast. I'm so happy y'all here with me uh, and Skip, who will soon to be arriving every first and third Wednesday. Um, we try to give <clears throat> a rational and radical perspective on various topics, issues, things, and happenings around the world. Um, anyway, there's a lot we're going to get into, but I'm going to try to hold back on the main topic, which is black sheep, liberal wolves, and uh, conservative Wait, black sheep, liberal foxes, and conservative wolves, which is goes back on uh, Malcolm X's analogy. And I know, you know, if you don't hate me now, if you don't hate me up to this point, probably by the end of this broadcast, low volume word. Oh, lower the volume, James. I'm not taking any of your insights and inputs. You you promised you come through for coffee. And I even up the ante from coffee to coffee and lunch. Ain't heard nothing from you. You know, just be having a dude. I got all dressed up, did have my hair and nail did, and you never showed up. So uh, I should turn the volume up because you be leaving a brother, you know, in the wind. What it, what's that song? You had me smoking out the window. <laughs> hey, where the hell is Jane? Jane. You know, so you got me smoking out the window. So, you know, keep your advice and your until you may until you do until you until you do right by me. No, nope. I, I know you meant the music. I'm just saying. What happened to, to coffee until you do right by me? You know, you right. Well, I know you live out in the nice areas. I, that's probably my fault. James, you live in the nice areas of Illinois. You up there with the white folks and it's hard for you to make your way down here with us who aren't so equally blessed and highly favored as you. So I, I guess I have to be more understanding. <laughs> nah, nah, nah. You just don't want to come to the South Side. I'll come to you. I'll come to you. I'll come up there in, in, in the beautiful uh, suburban uh, uh, and it's springtime. I'm sure all the, the flowers are blooming up there and all the nice things. So I'll just come up there where, the, where you know, come up there. Anyway, welcome to the Rational Radical Show. I'm sorry for that bit of emotional irrationality. Won't happen again. And uh, um, there's some things, you know, I was thinking since Skip ain't here. This thing about the Palestinian genocide. Now, I've already, you know, the way that they manipulate language, because this is really in tune with with today's broadcast. Um, the way they manipulate language and the way we go on with it, because they've got we 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 reflexively hear people talk about semantics. Oh, that's just semantics, as if meaning, as if nomenclature, as if titles, as if accurate analysis just doesn't matter. And and it kind of hurts me because language is important. Language is extremely important, and I think if you don't really have the appropriate vocabulary and you don't have functional and i'm not saying accurate definitions i'm not saying direct because we know how african people deal with language and uh i think we're too dismissive and i say this and i probably beat this to death i'm so proud of myself in saying this i don't know if i'm the first person to say this but i'm the only person i heard say it now, if you can give me somebody to attribute this to or who has expanded on it more than me, I will gladly give them credit. But African people underwent a counterintelligence program. And I probably said this before, counterintelligence. And it was successful. And we love to sit around and talk about how successful COINTELPRO 
was. But I think a lot of us exempt ourselves because many of us, like myself, I wasn't alive in that era. I know I look old, but I'm not that old because, you know, if I was around, shit would have went different. <laughs> I got to stop playing. Somebody called me Zesty in the comments, and now I'm trying to uh, poke my chest out more. I don't even know how to counter. What's the opposite of Zesty? But somebody called me Zesty, and I, I, I got to, you know, work on my branding. But anyway, I wasn't around back then. But we understand that COINTELPRO, well, I don't know if we understand. COINTELPRO, the, the term that we have for it, might have come about, thankfully, from, from the research of War Churchill and other scholars and whistleblowers. But the methods, the techniques, and the objectives of counterintelligence programs date way back way back to the Vatican, you know, way back. Really, you could say some of those techniques went all the way back to um, the Inquisition, you know. So it's not nothing new. But even in the U.S. political context, as we understand it, the, 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 the status quo, the elites, the rulers, the globe holders, the population controllers, as uh, wise intelligent calls them, when they first started seeing substantial, it's not even seeing, but feeling vulnerable, because a lot of times these the elites will lash out even when there's no threat. They like to pretend like the masses are crazy and the masses, they have to keep information from us and they have to, you know, be very careful because the mass hysteria, you always hear about mass hysteria, is actually a fallacy. The most hysterical, insecure, irrational population in the world are the elites, the wealthy. But we've also been indoctrinated to think the presence of money makes you more attractive, makes you more intelligent, makes you more worthy, makes you more moral. And this has been researched. If you can portray yourself to be rich, people conclude that you are just better overall. And this is nothing new. Everything we talk about goes all the way back to the time of monarchs and, and, and warrior kings. But I digress. All I'm saying is that the elites respond to all threats, real or perceived. So they've implemented these counterintelligence programs. Against, Garvey was a victim of a counterintelligence program. The UNIA was a victim of a counterintelligence program. Carter G. Woodson, the most passive negro the proper negro the negro we all should aspire to be cast down your pale you know the most you know it, it for lack of a better word if, if malcolm was here would probably say handkerchief head negro right carter g woodson was spied upon was not trusted right and even when they find out everybody and their mama, they had a, a FBI files on everybody from, it's not just the militants, it's not just the whitey, is the devil militants, Dick Gregory. Whenever there was a problem, all Dick Gregory would do is was fast and tell on you. He would tell it and then fast to fix it. And they had files on him a mile long. So all I'm saying is, we are either directly subjected to counterintelligence programs, or we are byproducts of those who were subjected to counterintelligence program. And we sit here and talk about COINTELPRO as if it's something that was either in the past or something that only people who were assassinated, people who were falsely incarcerated, or people who were in black radical organizations were subject to. When the entirety of the black population was subject to a counterintelligence program. And even the author of the book, even the author of the book, Ward Churchill, the, the man who literally wrote the book on COINTELPRO, says that the intelligence agencies and the, and the, the elite system in which they act on behalf of are when they, when we figure them out, when we say, well, hey, Leonard Peltier is innocent. The evidence doesn't support his life sentence. 
The evidence doesn't support Mumia's life sentence. It's been revealed through investigation that it wasn't some lone gunman that took out Dr. King. And it wasn't uh, the, 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 the surveillance that Malcolm X un was under from tapping of his phone and infiltrating his group was well beyond the capacity of the cult. So even when this stuff comes out and we think like, yeah, we got you, we got you, cracker. We, 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 we got the info, we got the document, we got the whistleblower, we got the insights, we got the evidence. It serves their interest. It serves their purposes when they do something clandestine and it remains hidden or they do something clandestine and is revealed or they do something blatant. It all articulates that they have the power. We're looking at Donald Trump go back and forth across the country and commit every crime that they accuse the Black Panthers of committing, that they accuse the, the Black Liberation Army of committing, that they accuse the deacons of it, that they accuse the UNIA. We're watching a man commit those crimes, overthrowing the government, delegitimizing the state, mobilizing radical anti-government forces. We're looking at the Bundy Ranch siege looking at armed white men put white cops in in the skull white federal agents declare their independence remember black people new republic of africa everywhere from alaska from the from the furthest tip of northern tip of alaska to the furthest southern tip of texas you got these people white people that want to break off the everything they accused us of doing being anti-american not loving americans sufficiently if you don't love it love it or leave it Right. And so we are products. We are products of counterintelligence. And when I interact with black people, the masses, or when I interact with black people who claim to be conscious, revolutionary, pan-Africanist, radical, pro-black, black nationalist, I see the evidence of counterintelligence. We don't understand the true goal of counterintelligence. Counterintelligence did not come about to take away our guns. We got more guns now than we had during the height of the counterintelligence program. We got black gun clubs. We got black organizations marching up and down the streets with guns. We got black men stockpiling weapons. And not only are they accumulating guns, they're putting those guns all over social media. Just go look up. Don't do it. I don't want to give no weight to this. But if you don't, if you doubt me, go look up that black Rambo dude. So it wasn't to disarm us. We got more arms now than we did at the height of the black militant era. So it wasn't to take away our guns. Militancy, militant. You got a man walking around saying, I am the prince of pan-Africanism and I'm the top uh, uh, scholar. I'm going all over the world. Even people from that era, we got these, the, you know, it's, we got militants, dime a dozen. We got militants a dime a dozen. People talk mad reckless about the system, overthrowing the government, separating from the government, that this is truly our nation. We're the real natives or go back to Africa. Whatever form of militancy you're into, whatever form of militancy you think is the biggest, the baddest and the strongest, I can point you to that direction, an organization and a prominent individual that adheres to that. So they didn't take away our guns and they didn't take away our militancy, our consciousness. What did we lose in COINTELPRO? What did we lose? We even still got Black Panthers here. Some of them, I mean, a lot of them are old, but now we got a new Black Panther Party. And what's the difference between the new Black Panther Party and the true, not the original, but the true Black Panther Party? The UNIA is still here. What did the counterintelligence program seek to counter? What did they counter? Because I don't think you'll find any people, everybody's rem reminiscing about back in the day. Black people are so fond of back in the day. You got black folks wishing we could go back to Jim Crow. Say, I'll go back to you because they fantasize about the black family and they fantasize about black. We had our own business. We had strong black families. We, we was we was united back then. 
why not do it now? We have all the same resources. In fact, most of the fundamental resources that we use to create the black liberation struggle, the black power struggle, most of the resources that we utilized are still here today in abundance. They're still here today in abundance. And in fact, we have more of it. Even, in, like I said, radicalism. We have more African people in the of the African di diaspora. We got more black people today that identify as African, who embrace their African lineage, who embrace their African features and characteristics, who, who uh, are more critical of the government and conditions. Most black people falsely talk about how things are worse now than ever. And they were like, listen, I should have brought the book up here. Here it is. I got to get my uh, things going. So what happened? What did we lose? Wapen, wapen. <laughs> Where is it? I'm really selling that book. How much is it? Damn. These books are expensive as hell. I don't want y'all to buy this book. Some of y'all slick on the internet. Get a paperback copy or get, or get a used copy. Because fuck this guy. Where's Goodreads? Anyway, I'll just pull it up. Let me just share this with you. Um, Because this is pertinent. Everything I say is connected. It's all connected. <laughs> oh, here it is. I just like to... I sometimes just use Goodreads. But this this right here. Uh, I'm going to share it. Wolande. Uh... I do this shit every fucking day and then I uh I, let me stop curse. I do this so often and still mess it up. Hmm. Beyond freedom and dignity. This is beyond freedom and dignity. And uh Bobby E. Wright, if you believe him in his scholarship, stated that this book, two men, two men are responsible. For destroying the black liberation struggle. One was B.F. Skinner in his book, Beyond Freedom and Dignity. It's an extremely, extremely boring fucking book. You would think, man, because I'm like, oh, this is the book that brought us down. And I was expecting to read some uh, uh, high science, some high science fucking Illuminati uh, like, remember them books, Behold a Pale Horse and the, the Committee of 300, Conspirators Hierarchy, The Unseen Hand. So when, when Dr. Bobby E. Wright wrote in his uh, essay on menticide that John B. Watson and B.F. Skinner were the two men that helped save global white hegemony, that single-handedly, I guess quadruple-handedly, because you say single-handedly, that's one person. So if it's two guys, you don't count all four hands. You count on single hand. So I guess double-handedly, tag team, destroyed the black liberation struggle. In his assessment, which I've found to be true. So is that beyond freedom and dignity? And sorry if I'm typing in your face. And this one. And maybe we should do study groups around this. But like I said, this ain't no, uh, they're very, oops, they're very scholarly books. Like beyond, like I said, when I was reading white folks coming after us and how white folks was going to do us, John B. Watson. So you got this one. Oh, it doesn't show both. This is weird. So you got John B. Watson behaviorism. Right, right, right. Dale Jones used to say that when he lectured. <laughs> See, I'm getting, it's weird because I'm getting to the age that I'm the age of the the my mentors and, and dudes who brought me up. So I'm getting to be their age and I'm seeing myself in there. So this one, Beyond Freedom and Dignity. Right, right, right. And the other one, Behaviorism. John B. Watson and B.F. Skinner. Now, Behaviorism is basically the 
understanding not just what drives people's behavior, what would make a people who were docile and passive for generations rise up and burn this mother down, make black people who will say go from, oh, oh, you are black and ugly, and you're black as tar to saying black is beautiful. To make black people go from saying, I ain't nothing but a slave. I'm a black man and I'm blessed to be here to make us say I'm an African. I'm Afro-American, I'm African. To say a descendant of slave and I'm great grass to be here again. Behaviorism is understanding not just what humans do in groups, but what provokes our actions what can direct our actions or what can subdue or reverse or retract or cease behaviors. And beyond freedom and dignity is basically saying you can maintain all systems of control, the technology and infrastructure of mass control while allowing people to believe that they have their freedom and dignity. So you don't need to say, call them colored, call him Negro, call him boy. You don't need to say, get to the back of the bus or drink out of this rusty fire, a water fountain. You don't need to, even though they did it for pleasure more so than need, you don't need to string one up every now and then from a tree in order to make sure they are subject to your will. You can give someone all, because black people, we want freedom and we want our dignity. It's like, here you go still impoverished, still oppressed, still fighting for the same shit today that we were fighting a hundred years ago and think we're advancing. And then have us reminiscing about when white people had more direct and overt racism and control over us. And we reminisce about the worst times as if they were the good old times. There were starving Africans who, as uh, Claude Anderson said, we were the first people ever liberated from slavery and then put in debt to the people who just enslaved us. That's how our emancipation played out. You went from being a chattel slave to a to 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 uh, a vagrant and then vagrancy laws. And you went back to work off a debt. We were the first people ever put in debt to the people we just worked for for free. And you had many hungry slaves. Many, many vagrant slaves like, man, at least when I was uh, under massa, uh, we, we ate. There was an incentive to feed us. Oh, Haiti, y'all, like, listen, it's just a quote. I, I, you go debate that with Claude Anderson. I'm just, yes, I understand. I mean, we probably weren't the first and won't be the last, but you did it. And actually, Haiti was was a nation. It wasn't a people. We we were citizens. We were made citizens of the United States, whereas Haitian was an independent republic. So it's not the same, even though it's exactly the same. But I ain't here to debate you. Anyway, I'm sure there were some slaves like, man, it was better. I mean, you would get the whiplash. You 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 get the whip from time to time, and you might lose a child or two if 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 the harvest didn't come in right, and Massa have to sell off a, a few youngin to, to to meet his quota or to, to pay off some debt. But all in all, you was able to eat and you had shelter. And one thing, the average white person, the white average of white people, I, I never owned a slave. Because you were property of the elite, you know, you were chattel and a white and the random white man could no more come and kill a black man than he could come and kill one of the white man's horses, you know, or, or take a hammer to one of the white man's plows because you was property and, and, and property rights. And people, some people take quite finely to their property. But then when we were no longer property, we were now uh penile in the penal system and incarcerated like i don't own this boy i could work him all day and send him on his way right and so there were some people who rationalized hey it was better back then and now and now really holla at me later indigenous oh right right you sure did you sure did give me that sight sorry Send it to me again. I'm a horrible person, but I, I got you. I actually looked it up and I used it for a few days. 
but you know, send it to me again, or I have to dig it out of my papers. What was I saying? I should have bookmarked it. And so, same thing with Jim Crow. There's some color folks who was like, oh, we had a higher marriage rate than, than white folks. We didn't, we didn't have mass incarceration, drugs, women didn't wear revealing clothes, and boys didn't sag their pants. We had our own businesses. So what? There was a lynching from time to time. So what any random white woman, like I say to you, just really, you really have to grasp. Imagine all those Karen videos. Do you imagine all those Karen white women ain't changed a lick? Imagine all those Karen videos. But instead of a, a meme, instead of a public dress down, instead of some, imagine every single one of those Karen videos that they happened just a few decades before would have resulted in a lynching. Every single one of them. You saw that Uncle Tom when he was in the bramble. I, let me not call him an Uncle Tom. That proper Negro, that, that uncle. Yeah, I guess he is an Uncle Tom because y'all like to, y'all try to reform Uncle Tom. You know, well, Uncle Tom, actually, Uncle Tom was a good guy. Fuck Uncle Tom and fuck Harriet Beecher Stowe. Uncle Tom, and come on, somebody come on in the comments and say, well, you're actually wrong. Actually, it's a Sambo. Actually, come on, come say it. Uncle Tom, proper Negro, as described by an affluent white woman. But Uncle Tom, remember when she was in the Bramble and she had her dog and the brother was out there bird watching? <laughs> Lynching. Whole family. Remember that girl out there selling lemonade? You think women were exempt? That little black girl selling lemonade and the white woman was hiding but calling the popo? Lynching. They lynched black children, threw them to alligators. They used to call black children gator bait. Black women lynching. But some people was like, well, hell, I could tolerate that. Let me get a business. Let me get a woman who has no... Uh, educational or economic options that if she married me, she have to put up with me because she don't have many other options besides find a man that deems her worthy of his affection and his care. Some brothers right now today want to trade. They want to go back to that. They will sell out the whole fucking race. They will reverse all progress that we've made. So what if my grandma and my auntie can sit in the back of the bus? If I got a business and a wife without options? I mean, goddamn. And if you're going to sell us out and go backwards, all you're going to get is a business and a wife without options? Mad peculiar. So, anyway. All I'm saying is B.F. Skinner came up with it's called the technology of control. How do I treat you like a subhuman animal while calling you my brother or calling you my fellow, fellow citizen? Behaviorism is saying, hey, what provokes black people and how can we redirect that rage? Black people are going to still be subjected to the same levels of hyper exploitation, dehumanization. But instead of getting uh, uh Having a white man in black face, having a white man with a with a with black face get on there and say, Mammy, I walk a million miles for one of your smiles, Mammy. How do we get prominent and respectable Negroes get on, get behind a microphone instead of singing Mammy? They'll say, It's hard not to kill niggas. It's like a full-time job not to kill niggas. And we'll be like, hashtag goals. That man is a legend. That's counterintelligence. Or better, that's menticide. The systematic destruction of a group's mind with the ultimate goal being the extirpation of that group. If I can destroy your capacity to comprehend, if I can destroy your capacity to construct, to, con to, to observe a phenomenon, and then... Your mind processes that phenomenon and makes conclusions that have no real connection to that phenomenon. 
you're fucked. I can make let you be a billionaire. I could give you all the guns. I could let you be president of the United motherfucking states. I could let you be a CEO. I could let you be a quarterback during the Super Bowl. Remember that? Y'all was acting real fun. First black quarterback. Oh, first two black quarterbacks. Y'all really going to explode when they have two black quarterbacks and two black coaches in the NFL Super Bowl. Or what if it's two black quarterbacks, two black coaches, and two black owners in the Super Bowl? Y'all, I don't know how y'all going to live. Y'all go into hysterics. But I can give you all of that. I can make you chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. I can put a black man over the Pentagon. Make every high-ranking military official from all the branches of the U.S. military have to answer to a black man. And under that black man's reign, there's more in U.S. incursions into Africa, the Caribbean, Central and Latin America. And let me tell you something. Central and Latin America got more black folks than the northern part of this continent. So whenever they go into it, so they got y'all tricked into thinking Latino, which means nothing. So Hispanic, which means nothing. And I'm sorry for you people who identify as Hispanic and Latino. But if you think you're Hispanic and Latino, ask yourself, what is your race, ethnicity, nationality? They should all be three different things. And you can't pick, make one a two thing. Is Latino a race, ethnicity, or nationality? And if it's one thing, it can't be the other two things. And one of those things is biological, phenotypical. One of those, only one of those things is in the blood. But I, y'all ain't ready for these conversations. <laughs> but you can put a black man over the Pentagon and the white people can go to sleep every single night as comfortable as they was if the fucking Ku Klux Klan was running the Pentagon. They have the same level of safety and security. Commander-in-chief. That's counterintelligence. And whenever, you know, I was comfortable grass rooting shit. I love nothing better than conceptualizing something and then going into the community to make it physically manifest. And I'm like, the only reason I started doing Bro Diallo show, if you've been following me uh, uh, the last decade, going from one thing to the next, uh, in terms of Bro Diallo shows, zero to 100 shows, the excavate, you know, doing this because we've really dropped the ball on this ideological shit. We dropped the ball. What in the world? Hold on. Sorry. I thought that was Skip. Normally I don't answer the phone, but I thought that was Skip. Still waiting on him. So, anyway. That's a good um, segue. But all I'm saying is, I don't think we fully comprehend what countering of people's intelligence and i know what y'all think well intel means something different no it don't no it don't and so we are uh <laughs> we are uh let me start Look. we are greatly greatly um we have a great deficiency on ideological not only on our ideological development and cultivation and reinforcement, but we value it so much less now. We value it so much less. We are now in the position that the desire to be free is enough. And we don't even ask motherfuckers, what does your freedom appear to be? All you got to do is say bad things about the people we don't like and good things about the people we do like. And you pretty much can get over. What does a world? All you who support Minister Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam, what does a world governed by a, 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 an apocalyptic cult look like? Same thing. Y'all cheering on these black Hebrew Israelites saying they're strong men and they getting men off drugs and all that bullshit, which they aren't. But let's pretend. What does a world under a yet another apocalyptic cult look like? 
Or you could take Cuddly Mike and, and Ice Cube and these entertainers who are who, who put themselves in, in, in leadership position. What does a killer Mike full of black banks and black entrepreneur, what does that a black entrepreneurial world look like? What does a black capitalist world, how will it function? And some of y'all are really fucking stupid enough to believe that black people can do something inhumane in a human, inhumane way. Y'all really think, well, the white man, he just does this because he's evil. <laughs> the white man is the devil. So if a white man going to do capitalism evil, but black people can do capitalist righteous. The white man's capitalism creates a very small elite class. And a massive, massive impoverishment and exploitation of all the rest. But black people, when we do capitalism, all of us going to be rich. <laughs> and the black elites are going to fight for us. Like white elites, they exploit. But black elites, they're going to fight for us. Now, white man needed to colonize the whole world to create capitalism. He had to not only colonize the world, he had to engage in perpetual warfare and develop more and more horrendous weapons and deploy more and more insidious tactics to continue to continue to make his system profitable. He had to had to go about assassinating world leaders, violating national sovereignty, creating international bodies of control, World Bank, IMF, UN. But when black people, black capitalists, they won't have to do any of that. People will freely say, hey, instead of orienting my economy and utilizing my natural resources, my raw and natural resources, Instead of using that to create goods for export for multinational corporations in the capitalist elite, under black capitalism, every sovereign nation can independently develop their economy and independently uh, cultivate their resources to the service and the interest of the working class and the masses of their people. Won't have to be no mass incarceration in order to maintain a permanent underclass of vulnerable labor. That's them. But uh, y'all really believe a black man, how the fuck we got so many black people earn your leisure. 19 keys. Cuddly Mike. Or should I say 19 keys of hopium. 19 kilos of whatever the fuck he's smoking and selling to the rest of y'all. Ice Cube. Jay-Z. We got a whole class of prominent black people out here selling us entrepreneurialism and telling you, Jay-Z said, calling me a capitalist is like calling me the N-word. You really think black people can do capitalism? Any Could the Chinese? Could the Chinese do or, or could the J Japanese? Could the, could the Muslim oligarchs, the Chinese oligarchs? The North and South Korean oligarchs. Name a population that was able to do capitalism in a humane fashion. Or even when they say we're not capitalists, but still compete on the capitalist stage in a humane way. We can do capitalism without destroying. We really believe that shit. We really got people selling that to us. When we do it, it's different. When we, when, when our people get up there and we didn't already have, we didn't have almost well over 100 years of black folks, almost 200 years. We've been free since the 1860s. <laughs> and I know, air quote, how many times are we still, why the blood clot are we still celebrating black first? Why? Y'all was, uh, it was a sister, the first black, black woman became general of the U.S. Marine Corps. We still celebrating black work. How many black people, how many more up there? How many more up there's do we need? And y'all want to, I can't, I can't cover it all. But all I want to say is understanding that counterintelligence, it did assassinate. It did incarcerate. It did subvert. It agent baited. It created disruptions within organizations, agent baiting. 
But the ultimate goal was to disrupt our very capacity to conceptualize a world that is contrary to the current status quo. So within this box of capitalism and white hegemony, we have a lot more leeway than we had before. We can say shit, do shit, get shit, buy shit, sell shit. There's so much we can do within this box. But the whole point of counterintelligence was to make sure the box of capitalism and white hegemony. And even when black people say well, we want to go back to Africa or we want to create, we want the United States to give us, you know, the Mason to give us Mississippi. What, what, what are the Mississippi? I don't think Arkansas is in that. Tennessee, they want us to give give us five states to black people. And now y'all celebrating black people going off. You know, this was last year. I don't know if y'all still them homestead. Remember them homestead black folks that was going out buying a whole shit ton of land. And they were all over social media. I'm a homesteader riding four by fours. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, this sister went and bought a whole town. Or this black couple, they went and bought 85 acres of land. And we're going to go there and build. Again, what ideology? What ideology is going to determine the intimate, social, political, relationships and hierarchies in that black village or black town what ideology is going to govern the production and distributions of goods and services and revenues what ideology that should be the first fucking question ideology is the most important thing that's the whole point of me being here but I'm all, the whole point of L, you go look at almost 400 videos on my YouTube. Makes me shudder to think. What is the ideology? And when you bring it up, people be like, oh. And, and, and I say this all the time. I sit and do this work for our people. And people are like, what are you doing? <laughs> this is funny as fuck. Because, you know, especially since I got on and started doing Black Power Media, people talk organize. Oh, you organize, brother, you organize. I'm going to organize everybody. And, you know, it's funny how a lot of black organizers, they often want to check and compare with other black organizers. And they don't really talk about how they out-organize white folks. Like, are you fucking organizing to outdo and outshine other black people? Or are you organizing to, to subvert white folks? But I digress. This is something black men in particular. But it also trickles down to black women. But since the moment African men set foot on this soil in shackles and chains. This is not so much for you black indigenous people or you black folks who came before Columbus, but for all the rest of y'all Negroes who ain't indigenous and who didn't come over here on the reed boat before Columbus. You Omex. <laughs> y'all can wildcat. But the black man has been measured by and valued by his physical work, his labors. By his labors. Now, when you look at white folks, when you look at their monuments, when you pay attention to their holidays, they were men of mental labor. And I say this all the time. Outside of the black people where you can be doing research, you can be engaged in philosophy, you can be articulating, dissecting, uh, critiquing. Philosophy, and they were saying, you don't work. Like I said, I tell this story often until I don't have to tell it no fucking more. Dr. John Henry Clark was giving a lecture, and he was talking about antiquity. He was talking about Egypt and its proper place within the larger African context and what were Western motivations and Islamic motivations for removing Egypt uh, and, and, and removing Egypt. Egypt from the African content and putting it in the Middle East. 
right? And he was talking about the, what necessitated that. And then he said, you know, Egypt of antiquity was an African nation full of African people who engaged in African culture. And you can see throughout Africa, you can see throughout other African nations, tribes, and cultures, the architecture, the philosophies that governed Egypt that we're so enamored of can be found in almost other any other organized population of Africa. And after he came and gave this grand lecture, some asshole stood up and was like, you were doing all this talking about pyramids. Why don't you build a pyramid? And Dr. Clark is like, we don't need a pyramid today. We have different needs. We have different challenges. We're under different conditions. So at one time we were, we could use our intellect, our imagination, our inspiration to erect wonders of the world. But in this time, our intellect, our energies, our science should go into address other issues. So the question is not, can we build it now? The question is, should we build it now? And I was pissed off. I went to a uh, rally for a teacher who was unjustly fired for staging, leading a student walkout. Well, she was accused. She was actually uh, suspended. And when she, they came to her room to walk her out and the, got around the school that this popular black militant teacher was being walked out of the New York public school, all the other public school, school students walked out. And then it got around to the other schools and the other and students were walking out around the school system and because she took some stances and she was known for defending. And the incident was. Um, it was a thing. It was in the she wasn't a theater teacher. I believe she was an English teacher, but it was the theater department was putting on a play and it was literally a white director doing something like young, gifted and black or some other black play. And he was use carelessly using the N-word with the hard E-R. And he was telling students, yeah, grab your crotch. You need to be more like an N-word. Come on, N-word. And you know how y'all do. And the students were like, we're not comfortable with this. We don't think this is appropriate. And the way you're directing and staging this play is unacceptable. And he was like, well, you're out. And so the students went to her and she went to the teacher. Anyway, she, she was walked out of the school. The students followed her out. I wasn't there, but they claimed she told the students to walk out. The students themselves said, no, we walked out of our own volition. She never encouraged us because it's, it's um, against policy for teachers to impose their politics on students. So anyway, long story short, there was this big rally. And I went to the rally and they held it at uh, Mega Evers College in Brooklyn. And Dr. Ben was there. And Dr. Ben was a lifelong teacher. And so Dr. Ben gets up. And starts, you know, and, and he was at Van Stage. This was way back in the early, early 90s. I was a freshman at Downstate, so it was forever ago. And uh, or first year at Downstate. And again, he's sharing some insights, some information. He was talking about unions and black labor unions. He was talking about his own experiences with being fired. And he wasn't just fired from being a teacher. He was fired. He worked as a a, a historian or archaeologist he was ran up out of museums and he was talking about all the stances he took and how he lost a lot of jobs and there were literally people in the audience is like we, we ain't here for that this woman losing her job is disconnected from all the struggles and all the principled stance we here to get this woman her job back so she can get her wage get her money up so she can get her back so Black men, in particular, have been always bronze over brains. And we even do that. The black man, strong body, weak mind. To the Up and to and including them taking away championships and heavyweight belts from us. Not drafting us. Kicking us off teams. Even when you got strong body and strong mind, they still don't want that. It's strong body, absent strong mind. Strong minds, weak body, you don't do no work. You don't put in no work. Because work is only defined for Africans. 
Now, Europeans, they have forums. They have think tanks. They have tra traveling professors. I've been to see so many black scholars talk. It didn't happen all the time, but it happened enough for it to sear itself. Well, what you going to do? What you talking about doing? He did his job. And I tell you, I've been to so many white lectures of prominent white people. And I ain't even talking about what I watched on YouTube or what I listened to recorded on, on cassette or VHS or DVD. I'm talking about sitting in the room. UMKC, NYU, University of, uh, I just, probably one of the most recent lectures I went to. Christian Parenti, not once did anybody ever ask those white men, well, what are you doing? I went to, to listen to a white man who wrote a book about the destroyed ecosystems and how the how so many conflicts are that they say are religious in Tropic of K. He said, well, I read the book and then the guy was coming to give a talk on the book and I was supposed to bring my book to get signed, but I wasn't coming directly from home and I was running late and I had to get my wife and I had to pick up my friend, uh, uh, Don and the three of us went, didn't even get the book signed, which is the main reason I went. But anyway, he's sitting there talking about war and conflict and destruction of ecosystems and, and uh, specific policy reforms. And nobody ever said to that white man, well, you're going to fight the war. You sitting talking. What do you do? Why don't you do something? Because every person in that audience was like, what he's doing is something. White men can be valued for their philosophizing, for their intellectualizing, for their conceptualizing, for their musings and imagination. And be tenured, six-figured, legitimate figures. That's part of anti-blackness. And while I'm saying that, while I'm on that, I don't know. I might have to just get to the topic. Let's skip. It's almost an hour in. But anyway, this all leads into it, man. Menticide is the number one problem confronting African people. Menticide. The very destruction of our capacity to comprehend, to grasp. And, and what's so fucked up about that is we know more now than we ever had. We have more access to information than we ever had. Like I said, I wasn't around in the 60s. I wasn't around during civil rights or the Black Power Movement. That's all before my time. But I'm old enough to remember microfiche. I'm old enough to remember Encyclopedia Britannica. I mean, I can even say it now, I remember the smell, of, you know, Dewey Decimal System. I know what it's like to have to research without a search engine, without Google Scholar, without being able to pull up any document. If I want to know what somebody said, you know. I know what happened to look at the bibliography and go through three different books and hop from bibliography to bibliography to get to a point, original source. I know what that's like. I can't imagine having access to fucking search engines and, 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 and online shit. It wasn't there in high school. The internet was brand new. I remember <laughs> I wasn't even into the internet. I'm like, oh shit. I mean, when I took typing in high school, I took it on a a, a typewriter. Even today, you know, my wife is like, why are you always banging them keys? And I type like I'm typing on a typewriter. Like you, if you ever used an actual typewriter, you know you had to let that keyboard know what you wanted it to know. You know, and it wasn't no word processor. I said typewriter, the one with the metal, with the gears and shit. You had to like push four or five buttons just to get a capitalized word. You had to use a fucking ruler to set the margins. So anyway, um, I know what that's like. And information today, I shudder to think 
if my great grandfather, Grandpa Sonics Bowie, a man who was thirsty for knowledge, a man who worked the rail yards his whole life, a man who raised a family under both the Great Depression and under Jim Crow. If he had access to the fucking, and we know less now, I tell y'all now, information saturation has the same outcome as information censorship. That's what behaviorism and beyond freedom and dignity, they was keeping us away from information. They was, they was, they was, uh, they was, uh, hiding information. They was censoring our information. Controlling our information. They were like, fine, open the fucking floodgates. Whatever you want to know can be with you within nanoseconds. Boop, 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 boop. What you want to know? Especially you wives. <laughs> Man, I can't say nothing without my wife. Like, huh? Okay. Yeah. All right. You know, I can't say nothing. She checked everything. I, every proclamation I make. I don't care. Even if it's something minor. And now people mad. And it's so wild that people was once like, we went from, you know, now they're burning books. There's too much information out there. Burn the books again. We back to book burning. Y'all wild for that. Y'all wild for that. And look at this. This is the kind of shit we do. Look at this. This is a good, thank you, helpful harm. When you Google current events, the first 10 links are Zionist websites, right? I thank you for proving my point of how fucking intellectually lazy we are because that's a burden. That's a fucking burden because I want some real insights on the Zionist struggle and I have to scroll past 10 links. <laughs> I mean, oh, let's see. Cause there's over 130 trillion websites. God damn. They say this all the time. It gets smaller and smaller. Let, let's see. How many pages does Ten links. Ninety-nine percent of searchers only look at the first page. This is how, like, like I said, I was out there. Now look at this, because he's like, "Oh my God, oh, the first ten links. What? How you expect me to look past the first ten links that came up in three seconds? Let me show you something. Let me just go to the topic. I don't know if Skip gonna join us tonight." I mean, let me show you. Let me show you something. And this is according to I just put it in. I just asked the question. How many pages does the average person look at in a Google search? It's estimated that over 99 percent of searchers only look at the first page of Google research. <laughs> and most of y'all don't make it to the bottom of the first page when you Google something. And I'm not even saying you got Doug, Doug, go. This is for any. Now, me, I'm part of the one percent. Because I generally ignore the first page because I understand how the algorithm and the pay to play and the sponsored sites. I almost skip it. I'm part of the 1%. Fuck the first page. Especially if it's a butt naked search. So it used to be, let's say I wanted to, it's 19 instead of uh, 2024. Let's say it's 1994. Right? In 1994, I was a student at Brooklyn College. <coughs> That's even too. Let's say 1984. I wasn't even, I was a little baby, right? I was 19 years old. I was a baby, right? And I wanted to learn about Zionism. I'd have to get up off my ass unless your parents had Encyclopedia Britannica. And you might could go to the store and buy you a National Geographic or you could uh, walk to... Um, your local library and ask the librarian if you could have the microfiche and then you go to the microfiche and you go to Z 
for Zionism or I for Israel or P for Palestine. And you get all these little slides and shit. And then you take them to this giant machine and you stick it in there and you pull up these old articles and you got to go through articles and articles. And then they had this carousel of journals. And then you must say, well, I want the journal on international affairs or the journal on this. And then you got to go through this carousel issue one, issue two. And if you were lucky, there might be a database. Or you could just be lazy and watch Walter Cronkite or some other old cigarette smoking white man when they used to be able to smoke cigarette while they, they read the news off the teleprompter. And you're like, 10 links. That's a lot. I'm supposed to look at 10 links. So information saturation. You know. How do I get that off? I don't mean to leave you up there harmful, but it's just an example. The first 10 links, you could go to Reddit. You can go to Twitter. You can even go to Telegram and look and talk directly to a Palestinian on the ground in Palestine. Like the fuck is going on? You can pull up newspapers anywhere in the world. And even if they don't write it in English, you could go and pull up a foreign language newspaper and then have the fucking computer translated for you. Any source of information you deem legitimate, you could go directly to it. We complain about having to look past, look at the 11th link or the second page on a search. That's wild. That's wild. It creeps me out because I even type in the shit. I'll ask my son. You know, I heard Diablo 4 was coming out for free. They was going to put Diablo 4 on Game Pass. Why ain't it out? And my son won't even type it in. He'll just say to his phone, hey, phone, when are, when are they putting Diablo 4 on Game Pass? So my cheap ass daddy can play it and without paying for the thing. He wouldn't say all that. And the thing will be like, Diablo 4 will be on Xbox Game Pass March 15th. So your cheap ass daddy does not have to pay for it outright. He don't even, he don't even have to fucking type. But I digress. This is old man. I'm an old man with cold bones and a hot tea just ranting. <laughs> yes okay see this y'all spoil y'all spoil like a cup of milk on the porch in the summer y'all spoil yes yeah, so the translation is a little wonky but it's getting better it's getting better or getting worse, depending on your perspective. But I'm saying you still have to work to get quality information. That's why you can like, share, and subscribe to the Bro Diallo Show. I don't steer you wrong. Or make a, a contribution, donation to the Bro Diallo Show. So anyway, we passed the first hour. So now it's time to piss y'all off for real. Today's show is titled Black Sheep, Liberal Foxes, and conservative wolves. And Malcolm X has made quite a few very famous comments about liberals. And I want to share some of them. Right? Hold on, Malcolm, calm down. Malcolm, I can, it's hard to keep up with, with the minister. So I'm going to share these. Please let me know if you can hear them. If not, I have to just say it, right? But I'm going to share these quotes on liberalism with Malcolm. And then we're going to talk about liberalism and conservatism. And y'all not going to like what I have to say. But I'm going to say it because that's my obligation to the community to tell y'all what y'all don't really want to hear. So here's the first one. There are many whites who are trying to solve the problem, but you never see them going under the label of liberals. That, that white person that you see calling himself a liberal is the most dangerous thing in the entire Western Hemisphere. He's the most deceitful. He's like a fox. And a fox is almost is always more dangerous in the forest than the wolf. You can see the wolf coming. You know what he's up to. 
but the fox will fool you. He comes at you with his mouth shaped in such a way that even though you see his teeth, you think he's smiling. You take him for a friend. Okay. That's one. That's one, right? So let's go. Why is it? Oh. All right. So that's one. Take notes. Here's the second one, a little longer. Wait, hold on. Wait for me, Malcolm. Minister, brother, minister. Okay. Now here's the next one. I'll do this. What in the world? Oh, here we go. Here's the next one. In this crooked game of power politics here in America, the Negro, namely the race problem, integration, civil rights issue, are all nothing but tools used by the whites who call themselves liberals against another group of whites who call themselves conservatives, either to get into power or to retain power. Among whites here in America, the political teams are no longer divided into Democrats and Republicans. The whites who are now struggling for control of the American political throne are divided into liberal and conservative camps. The white liberals from both parties cross party lines to work together toward the same goal. And white conservatives from both parties do likewise. The white liberal differs from the white conservative only in one way. The liberal is more deceitful, more hypocritical than the conservative. Both want power, but the white liberal is the one who has perfected the art of posing as the Negro's friend and benefactor. And by winning the friendship and support of the Negro, the white liberal is able to use the Negro as a pawn or a weapon in this political football game that is constantly raging between the white liberals and the white conservatives. The American Negro is nothing but a political football. And the white liberals control this ball through tricks or tokenism, false promises of integration and civil rights. In this game of deceiving and using the American Negro, the white liberals have complete cooperation of the Negro civil rights leader who sell our people out for a few crumbs of token recognition, token gain token progress all right and let's just share one more to really drive this home one more to really drive it home and then uh we gonna discuss amongst ourselves why isn't this working friendly and being a friend. stop it minister minister I was about to say something I shouldn't say because I remember how Malcolm got in trouble for speaking but out of turn. Or friendly and being a friend. Uh, full I screen. Oh. Well, anyway, hold on, hold on, hold on. Many whites ah, this is on Facebook, so it, it works a little different. All right. Y'all ready? Like to hear? Here it go. But being friendly and being a friend, I think. Are this two is one thing. I think there are many whites who act friendly toward Negroes. A fox acts, acts friendly toward the lamb. And usually the fox is the one who ends up with the lamb chop on his plate. The wolf doesn't act friendly. And therefore the wolf has more difficulty in getting the lamb chop in his plate. I'd like to point out though that- I, I, I say that because it is usually the, if you study the structure of the Negro community, economically politically civically psychologically and otherwise it's controlled by the white liberal mm -hmm. who usually poses as the friend of the negro who actually differs from the white conservative in in the same way that the fox differs from the wolf uh, their appetite is the same their motives are the same it's only their mannerisms and and methods that differ all right that's that so I think we're all quite clear on the minister position on liberals and on conservatives. And I'm pretty sure 
Now, if you disagree with Malcolm, let me know in the comments. Because I'm about to say some things that y'all not going to like. Y'all ready? And, and this goes back to when I was doing the show, when I first started the Bro Diallo show, Barack Obama was president. And I talked about him and his, like a dog. If you were following back then, and you, or if you go look at the Bro Diallo archives, you'll see my critiques and criticisms of Obama's policies, Obama's methods, Obama's critiques and positions. I was a staunch critic of Obama. And people would come to me and say, you're always talking about Obama. Why don't you ever talk about John McCain? <laughs> or why don't you ever talk about the Republicans in Congress? The Republican Congress is because there were some black folks that was like Obama would do right by us if Mitch McConnell would just let him. If it wasn't for the Senate, Obama would, you know, would be. And I always said, I wish Obama was everything that the ra white racist people said he was i wish he was a, a socialist i wish he was a secret mao maoist a secret uh uh marxist who had infiltrated the government who was trained in radical techniques in indonesia of, of subversion and infiltration they used to say wow shit and i used to always i said i wish that obama was everything the far right said he was right and i thought to myself when people would say you always talking about obama you don't ever talk about the opposition, I thought to myself, which I was dead ass wrong. First, I would say that's low hanging fruit. I think that the vast majority of black people have a very firm grasp and understanding of who the right is, who, who the, the Republican Party, the conservative, the evangelical, the right wing. I thought that the black masses had a firm grasp and understanding of who the right wing was. So not only did I not talk about Mitch McConnell, I did not really deem it necessary to spend time on the air talking about Clarence Thomas, Colin Powell, Condoleezza Rice. And, and even now today, I don't spend much time talking about Candace Owens and, and, and Thomas Sowell. I don't really spend much time talking about conservatives or conservatism. Because the vast majority of the black community, I think, we already know about that. Now, I might have to come on here and say, well, black folks, maybe we shouldn't eat meat. But I don't have to talk about not eating cats and dogs because we just don't do that. Now, if we consumed cats and dogs, then I'd probably be advocating that we stop eating cats and dogs. But since we eat cows, pigs, and chickens, I say stop eating cows, pigs, and chicken. Even though I am as strongly against eating dogs and cats as I am cows, pigs, and chicken. I think none of those animals need to be consumed by humans that live in an industrial food production system. But now I think I made an error. And the reason I think I've made an error is because conservatism is throughout our community. I think we misunderstand liberalism and our misunderstanding and miscomprehension of what liberalism is and us holding to half century old critiques of liberalism we have not updated our criticism our critique or our position on liberalism because we're still holding to which was a hundred percent accurate when it was stated but it's not accurate anymore malcolm x was right but there's also some critiques of malcolm's that we fail to grasp as well so i'm not even gonna beat around the bush i'm not gonna sugarcoat it i'm just gonna say some things and and then i'll open it up so y'all can 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 give me your questions comments and liberalism i'm questions comments and criticism number one liberalism is not bad liberalism is not good Liberalism is relevant to what you apply liberalism to. Simply taking liberal positions, 
advocating for liberal positions does not make you a liberal. Does not mean you are engaged in liberalism. Liberalism does not firmly place you into left or right uh, window of the political spectrum. Liberalism is a subcategory that can exist within any political ideology. You have Catholics, you have conservative Catholics and liberal Catholics. You have Republicans. Now, there, as Malcolm X stated, remember, Malcolm X said, in the and this is again 1963, and it's very important. I'm gonna write that down. I wrote it down already. I was about to write it down again. I already wrote it down. Look at this. Look at this. 1963. You have to pay attention to when he said it. Just because black folks we like to stagnate and fight the same struggles over and over and over, don't mean our enemies do. Just because we fighting over and fighting for the same shit we were fighting for and fighting over 100 years ago. We refuse to understand or acknowledge the evolution of the oppressors. We refuse to accept the evolution of our enemies. And believe you, and many of us don't understand evolution, but I ain't going to get into that. White people have the same fundamental agenda, but they have very different means of execution. I just discussed behaviorism and beyond freedom and dignity. They have new techniques and we got old analysis that do not fit in the modern critique. So what we have to understand, and it kind of disturbs me how hostile the black masses are about liberalism without fully understanding what liberalism is. And a lot of times there's so many black people that start to lean towards conservatism. When I talk about, and I will talk about feminism, I will talk about uh, the democratic leadership um, and the democratic party. I will talk about policies and how those policies are implemented and funded. And people think, like when I make critiques about feminist, and I say, you know, I have very serious issue with feminists. A lot of sexists and misogynists will want to come with me and break bread with me. They'll want to come and break bread with me like, yeah, I'm with you. When my critique of feminism is a leftist critique, my critique of feminism is it doesn't go far enough to liberate women. The demands of feminism are inadequate to speak to the oppression of black women, uh, particularly or, or women in general. My critiques of feminism is, is that it has allowed itself to be captured by the status quo and redefine feminism as girls having a greater role and a greater part of the, the dominant system and getting greater spoils from the dominant economy. That is my critique. And, but the dudes who come and say feminism has destroyed the black family, which it hasn't. Feminism has destroyed the morals of uh, and, 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 and uh, femininity of black women, which it has not. And a lot of times I will take for granted when I am doing a leftist critique. And a lot of right wingers will think, well, he's he's uh, criticizing liberals and I'm not a liberal. I hate liberals. So we both hate liberals. But my problems and issues with liberalism are much different than other people. Liberalism has a multitude of manifestations. Socialism, social liberalism, uh, um, neoliberalism, economic liberalism, laissez-faire or classical liberalism. But we just... Liberalism is a very important and distinct mindset, attitude, pos political position. It is a, uh, it sets priorities. So, I think that we need to back shit up a little bit. And this is another thing white folks will do. We let white folks spoil shit for us. And since white folks, we think we can't think of liberalism independent of the Democratic Party or even the U.S. political 
uh, arena. Just like we can't think of economics independent of capitalism and capitalist accumulation. Many of you cannot think of spirituality or religion or the concept of the divine or concepts of, of kinship and eternity independent of the Abrahamic religion. And I know it's hard. You got to work at doing it. And most people will think you are out of line, out of touch and immoral and crazy and, and, and all kind of shit because they are in that box. But anyway, we have to begin to. So how often have you heard someone talk about these liberals? Or I hate the liberals or identify Biden as a liberal. Or Hillary Clinton is a liberal. Bill Clinton is a liberal. Barack Obama is a liberal. When the vast majority of their policies were right-wing conservative. And right-wing conservatism, now, when you're looking at right-wing conservative policies, against, and then you reject all liberalism. You reject all liberalism. I've been a member of radical organizations that had progressive radical policies and within that radical organizations there were conservatives and liberals i'll give you an example a man i respect and a man i've had debates with we were in the same organization with the same goals and we would sit up till four in the morning going back and forth and it was hard. These were hard discussions because this man is a lot more educated and has seen, been through a lot more than me. And it was Dr. Linwood Tahi. He was in the same organization as me, National Black United Front. And Dr. Linwood, I don't know what he would say. So I'm not speaking for him. I'm only speaking of my assessment. I would deem him a, lip, a conservative within a black radical organization. And he did a lot to strengthen and advance and sustain that organization. But whenever we had a, an issue or a agenda or a program, he would always want to look at the economics. We got to look at the numbers. We got to look at what can be achieved. We got to look at the alt opportunity cost. We have to assess the risk. He was very conservative about how to go about things, and before we make a public statement, before we call the press, before we mobilize our our uh, our street organizers, before we bring in other organizations, he wanted to go over everything. Whereas me, y'all know how I get down. I ain't even got to talk about my position. And we would go back and forth. When I was anti-Obama, I was my wife was born and raised in Chicago. So even though I wasn't in Chicago during Obama's reign and the Obamas back when they lived in that Hyde Park mansion across the street from that synagogue. And um, my wife would just talk about the Obamas and this and that. And I'm like, screw Obama and everything he stands for. I ain't with that. You can't forget that. Took my style and I'm taking it back. So um, the... Uh, when, when it came time and Obama's presidential cam campaign was heated up, and if you know anything about Missouri politics, anything from, from Columbia, Missouri, the Ozarks, between Columbia, all the way to the state line with Kansas. So from central Missouri, going all the way to the Kansas border, that's in buff territory. And MBUF was one of the few organizations, like if you wanted to hold office, and I don't care what level, whether you wanted to run for Congress, you had to go talk to MBUF. That was the only secular organization, all the politicians, everybody who wanted to make an announcement, that, I don't care if you're running for city council, running for school board, or you want to mount a ground game for a political, for a senatorial or presidential campaign, you had to go talk to MBUF. Other than that, you most of y'all are used to got to go talk to the ministers, got to go deal with the ministers, got to go deal with the ministers. People want it in buffs endorsement or at least if you don't endorse me, I've sat in the room and people are like, listen, if you can't endorse me, at least can I ask you not to attack me? Not to come against me. Can I they would beg for our silence if they couldn't get a, a I say oh, the organization silence. So anyway. There was this guy, 
scumbag. He was leading uh, leading Obama's like a, a major um, administrator for Obama's Murray campaign. If you know, um, Obama did the 50 state blitz and he was the first like internet savvy or they used to call him the Blackberry president. And I know that seems really old now, but in 2008, Blackberry and all that shit was hot shit, cutting edge tech. Anyway, I'm like, fuck Obama. And I stated publicly to the organization, anybody would listen, an Obama presidency would be a catastrophe for black people. And M. Buff at that time had several balls in the air. They had several agendas. Political agendas, educational agendas, economic agendas. And some of those agendas was understood by the leadership. And remember the national headquarters of M. Buff was Chicago. The late Dr. Conrad Warwell was the national chair. But anyway, long story short, they came to me and was like, you and Buff and you out here talking crazy about Obama. And Dr. Linwood gave me this book called Obamanomics. And this is before he was president. So we were all speculating. He gave me this book called Obamanomics. I read it in two nights. And I'm like, this ain't too different than, than Bill Clinton's political promises. And, woo, woo, woo. And, and we talked until early in the morning. And I would close down the restaurant and sit in the restaurant until the sun was almost up. And anyway, long story short, because of the organization and organizational discipline, I'm like, okay, fine, I'll fucking vote for Obama. First, pre first guy I ever voted for president that actually took office. I've been voting since Bill Clinton, since 1992, I've been voting and nobody I ever voted for ever took office of president. In fact, most of the politicians I voted for, the only successful politicians I have voted for up until that 2008 when I voted for Obama was city council members and school board members. That's it. And I think a couple of water reclamation type, but that was it. I was constantly voting for losers. Still doing that proud tradition. But anyway, um, so we all that to say is there were conservatives and liberals in the same group had the same agenda and we would bump heads but on the other side we would work together to get the same goals accomplished in fact any healthy organization or any healthy body will have within it conservative and liberal the liberal perspective and the conservative perspective allow you to arrive at a cogent complete and sound plan of action or conclusion. There are things someone just called me a liberal when I was talking about guns and somebody said Diallo's a liberal with guns. I'm not a liberal with guns and the Republican Party are liberal with guns. I'm actually a gun conservative. I support gun restrictions and gun uh, registration and limitations on people's capacity to carry guns in, 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 in public spaces. I'm actually very conservative in my position on guns. I'm not, I don't support the fucking fuck the second amendment. Fuck it. And I think any sane, rational black person who looks at the gun injury and the gun homicide rate amongst black people. And for you to be pro second amendment means you're anti-black in my assessment. So I am a conservative, not radical, not liberal. I, I, it, I am radical, but most people grasp it. I am not liberal in my assessment of guns. I am quite conservative. Some people would even say ultra conservative. Right? When it comes to religion, I am liberal. I think that the there should be strong limitations of church and state. I do not think that church and state should be barriers between the two. But I also think that the churches should be taxed. But I also take the position that a person's ability to identify and practice their religious belief should not be encumbered upon. 
I'm liberal when it comes to religion, even though I'm anti-religion. I think the only justifiable means of limiting the, the in, religion should be through discourse, debate, research, through dialogue, discourse, and even arguing. And I and through mockery. But I don't support any physical punishments or barriers to any individual practicing their belief, even though I vehemently disagree with that belief. So that's a liberal position. So you see how one person, not just one organization or one party, a person can have liberal and conservative positions on a myriad of topics within their own mind, within their own value system. Here they try to simplify things because we live in a soundbite culture. We live in an anti-intellectual culture. And because the purpose of the news and the media is to provide, to capture people's intention in order to sell their attention to advertisers and corporate, they'll say the liberal this and the conservative that, the liberal party and the conservative party. And that is not because it is an accurate assessment. It is a total assessment. It is a marketable conclusion. It is a marketable argument. They oversimplify shit that should be respected in its level of complexity. And they over make things that are more complex, things that are actually quite simple. So they act like, oh, we don't know how to fund schools. It's just too complex. We don't know how to pay workers living wages. We don't know how to give people housing. But as far as political discourse and ideology, oh, that's simple, liberal or, or conservative. So the things that actually do deserve some discourse and are complex, they pretend like can be summed up left or right. Red or blue, liberal, conservative. And the things that are actually quite simple, how to assess refugees, uh, uh, process refugees, determine someone's refugee status and give them and adhere to the international laws as it relates to refugees. And they even know how to stop the flood of refugees. And it's not barbed wire fences. That you stop refugees by, number one, stop imperialist policies. Stop economically and militarily exploiting and invading other nations. Refugees, problem solved. Allow for nations that are experienced in an evacuation of their citizens, allow them self-governance. And I tell you the example all the time. There are several examples from Grenada during the, 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 the uh, New Jewels movement in Grenada. The Grenadian uh, diaspora started returning home. The Lava Loss movement in Haiti took power. The Haitian, uh, the Haitian diaspora started returning home. Kwame Nkrumah and his decolonial struggle. The, 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 the African diaspora started returning to fucking Africa. When Marcus Garvey said, hey, we can go back to Africa. We got agreements on the continent cultural and economic and political allegiances and partnerships with our homeland. And the, the same black folks was like, go back to Africa, you monkey. Are the same people that, that upended the largest black organization in history. And their main goal was to send us monkeys back to Africa. They were lying. So the answer to refugees, illegal immigration is clear and simple, but they act like that's complex. But Determining what's liberal, who's liberal, liberalism as a as a as a political ideology or a policy uh, uh, marker versus conservative. Now that's complex. They act like it's a throwaway. Liberalism is a good fucking thing. Liberalism is a positive thing. What is liberalism? I would allow you to look at it. I'm going to let y'all marinate on that. Actually, let me go get this call. Let me see if Skip is coming through or not. Let's see. 
anyway, give me a moment. I'm going to go and, and holler at your boy what, what we're going to do, and I'll be right back. We're going to pick up with liberalism is actually a good thing. And Exxon, those are the nations of the world today. See, all I gotta be is what Jack said I was. So I don't give a be about no buzz. I am about freedom. I never mind the chickens of the club. I will live and die for the cows just because. If I don't, I wonder who will. Y'all place value on your wheels and your automobiles and never acknowledge your children's diminishing skills or that they continue to feel all the prisons they build. My life is all God gave me to kill. I want us to be free, but y'all would really rather I chill. Why the blood of the slaughter is water and killing fields? She's jabbing and shucking, she's stripping and sucking for the pills. All for the love of the bread, she's dope. Sell pills, we blow, let pistols go. Got coke from the countries, gave crack to the Pope. And the government responds to it, just say no. Freedom fighting for the love, they selling out on the low. And a man ain't fit to live without something he died for. I'm in his trunk with the rifle like I'm Lee Malvo. Y'all want a Sambo, well I'm Skip Rambo. Jordans and camo, white tees and ammo. Put the freedom in the kick snare and the Sambo. I'm Rambo, put the freedom in the kick snare and the sample. Yeah. Fuck it, then I'm shaft, don't have no ammo. No spook, I don't sit, I'll yeah. kick in your front door. Malcolm with a K or oh, Mellow with four yeah. foes. That was body seven, but we don't know what we yeah. fucking for. Five and the six, we bang on the wrong thing. Let's fight against the people that came and names changed. Transatlantic trips that let the bodies hang. Ying from a tree, that's cool to ship a key. You won't fight against the system, but you're worried about me and who I won't sign. But you gon' find and gon' put it in the chip and embed it in your mind and all off in your spine. Confederate flags, I'm bitching because that bitch too fly. I will give you the answer, but we running out of time. Time, time, time. time. I see, see, I they don't wanna listen, so loud what I gotta be. Cause my people are proud of the poverty. That got they son shooting guns over dollar bills. He getting money, snow a sunny, but his daughter still read at her first grade level. And she 11 years old with her nose held high to the sky. Cause she got her first purse made. Yes, on her birthday, she was singing birthday sexless. Skim right over with showing in plain sight. Looking the other way, but knowing it ain't right. Like overfitted shots, not shine big. Gone over flashbang thrown in a little girl's home. Ayanna Jones, who? Ayanna Jones, one shot to the dome. She was seven years old. It's a shame. Imagine being daddy one day to put in your baby girl in the grave. Some things need to change. This ain't a game. If you play into the ma'am, you be slaving to the day you lay your face up in the casket with credit card sharks still asking if they could put your name on some plastic. Man, it's a war going on outside. No one is safe. I'm heavy as the dark spark. I'm a creator. Cause a little light might be enough to make some straight from the ways of the slave. The pain of the hunger is enough to make a sane man put it to your brain for some money in a chain. And I don't really blame him, cause if you win the game, screaming money in a thing, you resemble a filet. A lot of people saying that I'm preaching to the death. Man, get that shit rest. I'm going to the prep, won't come out of nigga chess. They in it for the checks. I'm in it cause I wanna be remembered as a fat Luke Rock. All right, I, I got in touch with uh, a boy, and you know, it ain't like Skip to say what he's doing and not come through, so he didn't let me down. He said the, the link didn't work. He said he wasn't able to get on, so okay, at least he's good and healthy. My bad. I don't know if it's my bad. I ain't taking credit. It could be the, 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 the software, so he did come through. And I didn't see it because I'm here doing the thing. But I sent him the link. I don't know if he got it. It's still not going through. There's some issue with communication. Because I sent him the message and it said draft for a long time. And then it finally went through. So anyway. A little interlude. I just wanted to check on my man because he said he was coming through and didn't make it. And I ain't like him to say he coming through and not come through. But he said I showed up and it the link didn't work. I'm not sure what's happening, but I did because the, the, I did have some issues with it earlier in the week too. So anyway, so hopefully you get, so anyway, I gotta, I gotta fix some things. I gotta clarify some things. Liberalism in the purest sense is about individual liberty. And the reason why the whole concept of 
liberalism came about was because it was under the impression in, in the Western world that we're dominated by. And that's why when people tell you, I ain't left or right, I ain't liberal or conservative, I ain't none of that. They really are, you can't really place them. You can't really place them. Because the, the, the hierarchies that we live under, the whole world, the hierarchies that we live, this wasn't always the case. But the hierarchies we live under are basically ones that were established and articulated through the European Renaissance. And you can say, oh, I ain't with that. I don't like that shit, but that's fine. You can deny it. You know, like some guy was just saying to me, paying taxes and being under this system is voluntary. <laughs> like we choose to be oppressed. We chose to be slaves. Like it, it, this guy was really like on some kind of Kanye shit. This, this is all voluntary. But if so, if that's the case, then, then you know, I don't know what to tell y'all. If you if you are going through living under capitalist uh, uh, domination, capitalist hyper-exploitation, ecocide, and white hegemony, and you sign up for this voluntarily, you are a peculiar individual. And, you know, whatever slot you left that allowed you to volunteer or opt out of this, whatever, let me have that slot. But I digress. But Africans should appreciate the concept of liberalism because Africans are in indigenous cultures were essentially liberal. We did not have the top-down strict hierarchies in our governance, in our religions, in our social relationships. There's a good book. Let me see if it's still out. Uh, here it is. This is a book I have, which is a really interesting book. Why is everything on fucking Amazon? Fuck you. I'll go here. That's not the cover. I like the other cover. <clears throat> I guess I have to go. Broke it. They don't have a picture of the book. Okay, let's go to fuck it. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't mean to leave y'all hanging. Oh, you can get it for free here. Anyway, there's this book called Women of Africa, Roots of Oppression, right? And I was given that book by a feminist. And I had it for years. And real talk. I'm like, I ain't reading that shit. Some white woman talking about black folks. Telling white folks, black folks business. You know, the last thing I want to hear is some white liberal <laughs> tell me about the roots of oppression in Africa, right? But then one day I was just messing around and I decided this is my copy. This is the cover I have. And I'm like, women of Africa, roots of oppression. And I started to read the book and it talked about pre-colonial Africa. And when you say pre-colonial Africa and you leave the Arab slave trade, Arab colonization of what's falsely called North Africa. If you're not going back before then, you're not talking about pre-colonial Africa. If you talk about pre-colonial Africa, only goes back to the Dutch and the fucking Portuguese. If you only go back as far as because the African, the Europeans arrived, landed on an invaded, colonized, enslaved Africa. And they just got the part that the Muslims left over. Get mad if you want. Anyway, this book basically talks about it. now we didn't now we don't have the language. When Europeans came to Africa, they said they saw kings and kingdoms and tribes. They were looking at wives and husbands and they didn't have the vocabulary to describe the phenomenon that they were observe it would literally not literally but figuratively being like a an ant let's say you have an ant colony and you have an ant scholar 
And that it operates over, you know how the hive works with the queen and the queen is the only one that reproduces. And, and then you have the soldier ants. And so you have an, uh, an ant scholar that looks at human society and human civilization that we would say is more advanced and trying to use ant terminology for the social relationships of ants. You got the queen ant and you've got the soldier ant and you've got the worker ants and you've got the pupae. Some aspects of that ant colony can be understood. Okay, there are human soldiers and soldier ants. There are human workers and worker ants. Where is the queen? Where is the drone? And there are certain things that, and so when Europeans came to African societies that were millennia older than theirs, Africans had had civilization, language, economies, much older. So you had this brand new society these brand new social relations coming into a society that had been around long before. And so they were saying, well, that must be the king. That must be his compound and his wife. And they didn't know what the fuck they were looking at. They didn't have a vocabulary to describe what they saw. So they started superimposing their own comprehension, and their own understandings of what they saw. And they started trying to find uh, uh, examples for that they were familiar with. And a lot of times they were superimposed. They did the same here thing here in the United States. And they had absolute monarchs. So if you go to Europe, the Middle Ages, Dark Ages, if you go to Europe and you say, hey, the king could come to you and say, hey, you could take these people. You could take this land. And what the king say is law. So they'd be like, Take us to your king. Take me to your leader. And sometimes the Africans will be like, well, you, you want to talk to the shaman? You know, you want to talk to the, the griot? You want to talk to, because you can't talk to any women. Of course, women can't hold positions of power. I had a book that's really good on that. I think it's down here. I always reference this book and I never have it available. Because I always go back to this one particular book and is it over there? No. I always go back to this one particular book. And so it gets moved around the house a lot, but I ain't going to get into that. All that to say is you couldn't use European vocabulary to describe black phenomena. But if we were to stretch the meaning, African societies were essentially liberal. African societies had regard and respect for individual liberty, individual expression individual pursuits so in europe if you pray to the wrong fucking god they will cut your tongue out let me see look at this shit there's a museum here we should get together we should get together and uh they have the the the, the torture museum here in New York. Um, so, but anyway, in Europe, worshiping the wrong God could get your tongue cut off. Or they had this thing called the breast ripper. They would take a woman who's a witch and rip her breast. Or in Africa, they came there and saw women with their breast out. And so they come from a society that rips women's breast off and they created devices. So imagine you come from a society that uh, the iron spider, shit, look at that shit, where breasts were seen as dark or, or sinful or worldly. And so they had this breast rip, um, ripper thing. Where they would, they wouldn't just use the breast ripper to to grip the woman's breast and rip it. They would, uh, they would. Um, I guess I could short. Y'all want to see this shit? How do you? I don't know how to. Oh, maybe if I did this. So that's the breast ripper. And in Europe, and women who were not properly Christian, they'd grip the woman's breast and rip it. 
and they would stick it in hot fire. So when they put it on the woman's breast, it would seize and burn and they would cauterize. They learned that if you were going to use a torture device and the main purpose, because if a torture device killed you, it would be no point because the point of torture is not to kill the person, but to cause them an enormous amount of pain. So they learned that, hey, we make these things like this breast ripper. I had a bigger picture. Let's see if I can enlarge it a little bit. So the breast ripper, they would uh, burn it. So when they put it on there, you wouldn't bleed out. It would cauterize the wound. And then they would literally use it to turn left and right and to remo eventually remove the breast. And then you have uh, the head crusher. They put your head in there and they turn it slow. This ain't no fast thing. They would turn it as your your eyes start to bleed and you, after it, and, and then the saw torture, that's pretty straightforward. And they would, again, these are slow methods. Uh, uh, the Virgin of Nuremberg, we, all, we know it as the Iron Maiden. So imagine the people coming from a culture like this and they come into an African culture. And, and, and most of these, this is where they would, would separate your spine. Um, they would paralyze you basically and slow painful death but the main thing now they're getting up to when black folks I tell you all the time they didn't invent these instruments and these these tortures for uh, for black people they mastered these weapons and these divide rat torture I ain't gonna get into that oh the pair of anguish <laughs> the pair of anguish was for uh, women who basically gave an abortion and any an abortion is if a midwife or a nanny comes and tries to help a woman to, or miscarriage, liars, blasphemers and homosexuals. And we talk about white man brought homosexuality to Africa. Um, when it's the white man who brought the persecution of homosexuals to Africa then and now but they put this thing inside your open orifice for women her vagina or anus for a man in the anus and they turn it and it would open up and crack your pelvis and you could live quite a long time for days having this thing split you open from the inside of course the seat they they put you on the seat anyway i'm basically saying africans culture african society was liberal and you know Europeans would talk about primitive socialism and they would say that African men way back 14 1500s that African men were feminine woke that African men were didn't have proper control over our women or our children African children were misbehaved they weren't constantly beaten and limited they and African children were fully integrated into the society when the Muslims came and they would see women running the market when women weren't allowed to engage in commerce or women uh, unmarried women out and unaccompanied by an adult and like I said breast out skin showing and so liberalism it, it is quite peculiar that Africans who come from essentially a culture that could be defined in the modern context and in the uh, historical context as liberal cultures, at least socially liberal cultures that have so many African people that have a very hostile assessment and a hostile position towards liberals and liberalism because so many non and fake liberals or, or, or conservatives parading as liberals or so many uh, um, the the party who advocates for liberal policies also advocate for quite reactionary and ultra conservative parties at the same time. So when we attack the Democrats, which we should, I don't think any black person should be Democrat, uh, um, especially on a national. I don't think I will not be voting for Biden. I went yesterday to an election and black people, we had two opportunities to advance progressive policies and the right wing was able to get black people to vote against two progressive policies by painting them as liberal. Um, the, the, the bring um, a, a very progressive policies that would implement a progressive tax and another one to amend the constitution to reduce the 
tax burden on the poor and working class and increase the tax burden on the rich. And both of those were voted down because they were told to be liberal. And black people, we're listening to Malcolm X. And when you listen to Malcolm X and his assessment of liberals, he's is no longer. He was again, he was right then. He's wrong now. Remember, he said that the the conservatives, the conservative whoops, what did he say about them? He said that they were honest and that they were not hypocrites. He said that the liberals are deceitful and hypocritical. Now, if you also listen to what he was saying, he was talking about liberals and conservatives in the context of the civil rights movement. He specifically called out the civil rights leaders who were funded by and directed by the liberal class. He was talking about integration. When Malcolm X said that the conservatives were honest, he didn't say the conservatives were honest overall. He was saying conservatives were honest about their refusal to integrate with black people and their refusal to upend the black codes, to upend Jim Crow, to upend the separate but equal policies. That's what he was talking about. And he said that the liberals claimed that they did want to up in Jim Crow, that they did want to allow the Negro to integrate and that they did want the Negro to be able to fully exercise his constitutional right and have full constitutional standing and in the second class citizenship status of the Negro. And they accused some liberals of cl falsely claiming to unite with black folks or Negroes to do that. And other liberals, even though they may be sincere, they oppose the effective tactics. They wanted Negroes to be patient. They wanted Negroes to be passive. And they wanted Negroes to be sensitive to the, to, to the, the uh, racist. They wanted Negroes to not offend the sensibilities of the average white Americans. And they felt that we had to convince white folks to join and be sympathetic to our cause. And we had to be very careful not to offend white people when we're making demands. And we shouldn't make demands that were too broad. And we shouldn't try to push timelines that were too aggressive. Now, I tell you right now, in 2024, none of that applies. It doesn't apply. Malcolm X's assessment of liberals and conservatives no longer is accurate. Does that mean that liberals are no longer deceptive? No. Does that mean that liberals are no longer hypocritical? No. What it is, is that where they exercise and impose their hypocrisy is different. He was wrong about i'm not i'm saying he was right i'm saying i'm not saying that malcolm x was incorrect then i'm saying now his assessment no longer applies and if we rest on his assessment we will be very vulnerable and here's something else you have to know and this is something else you have to understand malcolm x said this in 1963 and it's insane that many of you who are intellectually lazy will just rest on that critique. He said that the conservatives were honest. And you name all you people in here, Malcolm was right, Malcolm was right. Type in the fucking comments right now and name an honest conservative. Type in and name an honest conservative right now. If you can type in the comments, if you can type in the comments and name one honest conservative, you'll win me over. Because he said the liberals are deceitful like a fox. But the wolf, you can see them coming. They're no longer deceptive. He also said that the conservatives wanted no parts of the Negroes. The Koch brothers are, are but and, and it's just crazy to me. We are, well, some of y'all don't even understand this. Um, We're very clear 
on, or some of you should be clear, or else you shouldn't be discussing politics. In 1992, the DLC, the Democratic Leadership Coalition, under the leadership of Bill Clinton and his wife, remember uh, Hillary Clinton said, if you elect Bill Clinton to office, you're getting two for one because she wasn't going to sit and stand in the oven. And she wasn't going to stand. She wasn't going to stand in the kitchen and bake uh, cookies as the first lady. Now, this motherfucker said that the Koch brothers were honest. Do I need to say he believes that the Koch brothers are honest? The libertarian Koch brothers are honest. Oh, the Koch brother. No, you're not saying. See, I asked you to. No, he's just saying the Koch brother because I said the Koch brothers. And then these motherfuckers, the thing about when you say these motherfuckers are dead, the impacts that they have live long. We still suffering through the bullshit George Washington did and Christopher Columbus did. You know, that's what Dell Jones was like. All these old fucking races. Dig them up and, 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 and bury them again. <laughs> piss on their grave. I want to piss on your grave. Anyway. <coughs> The Republicans are honest in regards to where they stand with us. Show me where the Republicans are honest. The Republicans now are claiming to be anti-racist. They claim to want to help black people. Bill, uh, 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 um, fuck is his name. Donald Trump said that he had a plan for black America. Donald Trump sat across from Kanye and Ice Cube. Because y'all get mad because, you know, everybody's sharing that picture of um, Glorilla and, 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 and Biden as if the Republican and the right wing don't use artists too. They just have to use shitty artists. <laughs> they have to stand in uh, Kanye. Um, what's it? What's his name? That other uh, minstrel. Kodak Black. But th this is the problem. This is what I feel that I'm should have to talk about shit I didn't think I have to talk about. I didn't think I had to sit here and discuss hypocrisy and deceit of the right wing. But now black people using an, 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 a, a, a half century old uh, assessment that was dealing with a pol political, uh, a very particular political agenda and a very p particular political struggle. And another thing intellectually lazy people do, they confuse uh, uh, acknowledgement of the difference as an endorsement. So if I say there is a different between difference between Democrats and Republicans, there are distinct differences between Biden and Trump. The intellectually lazy individual will literally say, "You must support one or the other," because it is too much to grasp that it, a, a mind can say, "I am looking at both and making assessments of both." And I can acknowledge the differences of two bad things that are different. What I say Monday, there's a difference between venom and poison. And venom and poison can have the exact same outcome, but have different mechanisms, different techniques. Different techniques. But uh, the simple mind will say there ain't no difference. So I'm going to go ahead and tell you. And it's a shame that I convince you. The conservatives, the conservative movement, the conservative parties, conservative politicians are hypocritical. They are dishonest and they fully have as much rhetoric to abide. Every election cycle, they dig up whatever colored folks and Negroes they can. Right now, the Republican Party is trying to make appeals to women. And they want to appeal to women just because you suck at something don't mean you didn't try it. We think, oh, they're really bad at it, so they must not be doing it. They're really bad at hiding their contempt for black people. So that means they're not trying to hide their contempt for black people. But the Republican Party will say we're not a racist party. And you have videos all over the Internet. You can go to the good liars and they'll have. They go to those Republican things and say blacks for Trump. They have a whole black for Trump thing and all these white blacks for Trump. And black people will sit there and say, well, the, the Republicans are honest that they hate us. When Donald Trump is running on the fact that I gave black folks more jobs than anybody. I did more for the blacks. And, and, and lie to black folks faces and black people still sitting here like, oh, the, the Republicans are honest. 
and the Democrats are dishonest. <laughs> the Republicans aren't hypocritical. The same evangelical family values has as their front runner a convicted sexual, not a convicted, but a, what do you call it? A man who uh, has to pay almost half a billion dollars and accused. An accused sexual predator whose accuser was validated in a court of law. An accused sexual predator mar married three times, cheated on his pregnant wife, half his age, pregnant wife with a porn star. And he's the family values conservative evangelical candidate and black people will look at you in a straight face and say the democrats are hypocrites and the republicans aren't the family values candidates the working man candidates we work we're for the work and we're going to bring jobs and then get when president bush i mean president bush well i can't oh my god but tr president trump the only his most significant legislation was to give a trillion dollar tax cut to reduce to give the billionaire class a permanent tax cut and to 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 salve over that fo effing over the working class he gave a, a temporary tax cut that has expired and wasn't renewed screwed over the the white working class and people will sit here and say well malcolm x told me that the conservatives are honest and that the liberals are the hypocrites. And I have to say this too. Malcolm X was a member of a conservative organization. So his assessment of conservatism and liberalism also needs to be critiqued because Malcolm X was literally a member of a conservative party the nat the nation of islam 1963 and the very speech where he talked about liberals let me see if i can find the opening to that speech i should have left it i had it up but you can just look at the opening of this Because I think the black masses need to revisit liberalism. I think the black masses should not allow the white reactionaries to sour us on what liberal values and liberal policies. Because my problem is if uh, the appropriate response when the de liberal society starts to decay, the appropriate appropriate response is to be ultra liberal to be to the point where you become a leftist and a radical the problem with liberalism is two things either liberalism is where the, sorry i don't know where that thing went the problem with liberalism is that it is inadequate to fight fascism liberalism works just fine in the absence of fascism, racism, uh, classism. But let, let's go to this, right? This is a from the digital history, right? Now let's look at the speech in which he attacked liberals. I don't know if y'all can see this. It's further down. This was uh, spoken. He said the Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us that it was evil sin of slavery that caused the downfall and destruction of ancient Egypt and Babylon and of Greece, which isn't true. He's wrong about that, as well as ancient Rome. So it was e the evil sin of colonialism, slavery in 19th century that caused the collapse of the white nations in present day Europe and world powers. Now, he could have been talking about World War II. And so, but anyway, the most honor, and, and let's go down a couple of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us that it is, it was divine will in the case of the destruction of the slave empires of ancient and modern past. America's judgment and destruction will also be brought about by divine will and divine power. Just as ancient nations paid for their sins against humanity, white America must now pay for her sins against 22 million Negroes. 
White America's worst crimes, her hypocrisy and her deceit. White America pretends to ask itself, what does the Negro want? White America knows that 400 years of cruel bondage has made these 22 million ex-slaves too mentally blind to see what they really want. Skipping a paragraph. We, the Muslims, who follow the most, most honorable Elijah, I can't even say it anymore. I used to say that all the time. Believe wholeheartedly in the God of justice. We believe in the creators whose divine power and laws of justice created and sustained the universe. We believe in all wise supreme being, the great God who is called Jehovah by the monotheistic Hebrews. We do not believe in the trinity of plurality of gods as advocated by polytheistic Christians. Christians are not polytheists. We who are Muslims call God by his true name, Allah, the great God of the universe, the Lord of all the worlds, the master of uh, the master of the day of judgment. The most honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us that Allah is the true name of divine supreme being and that Islam is an Arabic word, which means complete submission to God's will, our obedience to God's guidance. Y'all following this? So it goes on and on. Right? And he says, white America is doomed. God has declared that the most honorable Elijah Muhammad is our only means of escape. White America is doomed. God has declared that the most honorable Elijah Muhammad is our only means of escape. When you reject the most, Eli most honorable Elijah Muhammad, when you refuse to hear his message or heed his warning, you are closing your only door of escape. When you cut yourself off from him, you cut yourself off from your only way out of divine disaster that is fast approaching white America. Right? So these are the parts. These are the part that in the same speech, if I can scroll down. Uh, then in later in that speech, he says, the white liberal dif differs from the white conservative only in one way. The liberal is more deceitful than the conservative. The liberal is more hypocritical than the conservative. Both want power, but the white liberal is the one who has perfected the art of posing as the Negro's friend and benefactor. And by winning the friendship alliance and the support of the Negro, the white liberal is able to use the Negro as a pawn or a tool in this political football game that is constantly raging between white liberals and white conservatives. Politically, the American Negro is nothing but a football and the white liberals control this mentally dead ball through tricks of tokenism, false promises and integrations of civil right and civil rights. In this profitable game of deceiving and exploiting the political uh, politician of the American uh, Negro, those white liberals have the, the willing cooperation of the Negro civil rights leaders. These quote unquote leaders sell our people for just a few crumbs and tokens of recognition and we already played that. Now listen to me. If you go back and read a good three-fourths of this whole presentation is him, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, and saying historical falsehoods. So the same man that's that you're deriving your political critique from is saying what is he's describing? Oh, fuck. Where's the lie? Seriously? So you believe that Elijah Muhammad is our only escape and America is going to face divine judgment for slavery. And you believe that all the great empires of the world in the past fell due to slavery and God's ju judging them for slavery. The very God that is a proponent and a supporter. And if God was really going to destroy nations for slavery, he would have destroyed Islam. Before it got up, because Islam has always been engaged in the slave trade. So. I say all the time, I would have never worked with NOI Malcolm. I would gladly and enthusiastically break bread and work with and follow the leadership of the secular OAAU Malcolm. But this same cult that took his life greatly warped his assessment. And I love Malcolm. 
more than many of y'all because many of y'all like to play footsies and pretend like I got great respect and great love for Malcolm. And I got this enough respect not to just take what he says as a grain of salt. Because later in his life, just a few years later, Malcolm X said, I would open all my speeches with the most honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us. And I regret leading so many people to that organization. He said, we had a good group until the Negroes came and messed it up. And Malcolm was even critical of his previous positions. So all I'm saying is Malcolm was part of a conservative group. The Nation of Islam was then and is now a conservative formation. Go and look at Farrakhan's most recent quotes on women. Farrakhan blamed daughters, blamed mothers and girls for when fathers molest daughters. Farrakhan said the reason a father will mess with his daughter is because the daughter looks like the mother used to look. And the daughter has the same level of deference, love and admiration that the mother used to have. But he said the mother gets fat. The mother starts being rude. The mother doesn't want to cook anymore. The love, the mother no longer looks at the father in awe. So he finds that in his daughter. So when fathers mess with their daughters, he said it's because the mother got fat and sloppy and rude. And the daughter looks at him the way the mother looks, used to look with him and look like the mother used to look. Go look at where he said Jay-Z needs to check Beyonce and tell Beyonce to cover up. The nation of Islam from its inception to today has always been a conservative and reactionary. Farrakhan solution for black America, the nation of Islam solution for black America is savior from on high. And when the Christian minister says, bow your head and pray and God will save us, y'all just be like, oh, that's some old pork chop preacher. But when the NOI says it because they pe pepper their salvationism with militant black talk and they got brothers with some guns that are always aimed at other black people for some fucking reason. The entire body count of the NOI is other black people, but that's another discussion. The NOI is a conservative organization. So when someone who has been indoctrinated by a conservative, y'all talk about the nation wake somebody up. You can't wake somebody up talking about big head scientist and grafted man. That's not waking somebody up. That's just a different form of indoctrination. So I have to say to you, our assessments and conclusions about conservatism and liberalism need to be reassessed and reevaluated. We do not honor Malcolm by simply regurgitating what he said or uncritically accepting what he says. That is not love. And brothers, I'll talk to you. Any brother that has truly been loved by a black woman, and I'm only speaking because that's my experience. My experience of love has come from black women, intimate love especially. And you know, the love of a black woman does not present itself as you are the greatest. The love of a black woman is as critical as it is affectionate. We'll call you out. As quickly as it will call you in for a dinner, it will call you out for your bullshit. So we show our love and respect and honor of Malcolm, not by regurgitating and blindly accepting what he says, but critically assess, uh, assessing what he says. I understand what Malcolm was saying. Malcolm was speaking to a community under a civil rights struggle. Malcolm was talking to people under Jim Crow exclusion. Malcolm was assessing the leadership and prominent blacks of the day on one side, and he was true in that. But on the other side, he was a member of a conservative reactionary cult. So Malcolm was good at defining the problem, but he was very poor in, in the solution. And he himself, he fortunately figured it out before he died. And in fact, the fact that he figured it out, y'all still stuck with, with NOI Malcolm. You disrespect Malcolm if you lock him into the NOI. He became, he outgrew and grew beyond the NOI. And I say he was always bigger than the NOI. Y'all say the NOI woke Malcolm up. I say they hindered and delayed his growth and then took his life when they could no longer do it. But that ain't what we're here to talk about. I'm telling you, the fundamental 
principles of liberalism are sound. The problem is that the Democratic Party takes liberalism, individual rights and freedom, aid for the infirm, just distribution of resources, fundamental rights, and they use liberalism as a coding, as a cover for capitalist agendas. It is extremely insidious and it is extremely effective. It is something that we need to call out and oppose. But the problem is because of this poorly sussed out and surface assessment of liberals and liberalism and the tactics of the Democratic Party, it is causing too many of our people to lean towards and be susceptible to right wing ideologies, right wing policies and right wing figures and right wing parties. If we go from liberal to right or liberal to conservative, we are losing ground. We must go from liberal to revolutionary, radical, far left. And too many people confuse liberalism with leftism and far left. The reason we must move beyond liberalism is not because liberalism is bad. Liberalism is, we have to move beyond liberalism because liberalism is inadequate to address the challenges. So I'm talking to progressive black people and they say, oh, the liberalism. And they're against liberalism. Liberalism says women should have a right to choose. Women should have a right to access to abortion. Liberalism says people should have a right to worship and a right not to worship. That every person has their individual right to pursue their divine objectives. And, and the people who disagree or do not follow that particular divine uh, uh, projection should be free to reject and be free of. Liberalism says people, regardless of their gender identity, regardless of their sexual preference, deserve to have their rights protected. And these are all things that the Democratic Party has, has been identified with and captured and have bastardized and pimped. And the left, too many people who claim to be on the left are abandoning those things to the Democrats instead of taking those things from the Democrats as we depart from the Democrats. And many of us are not only abandoning those liberal positions and liberal policies, welfare. You got black people out here talking about welfare destroyed the black family. Because it's easier to attack welfare instead of capitalism. And many of these people who are telling us to be anti-liberal and to attack liberalism, they can't say we need to attack capitalism because they want to be capitalist. They want to be the head of household, the breadwinners. They want to subjugate women. They want to have capitalist accumulation. They want the ability to murder people at their whim. They want to be armed to the teeth and have the right to stand their ground and protect the little transient material shit and have material things over human life. So the reason so many people attack liberalism without properly defining what it is and use the failings of the Democratic Party to justify embracing right wing reactionary positions and parties and individuals is because they want to assume power within the system as it stands. I am not a liberal. But the reason I'm not a liberal is not because I do not agree with liberal policies and liberal positions. I am not a liberal because liberalism is inadequate to meet the needs and inadequate to oppose the white hegemony and capitalism. Liberalism, because of the way it's formulated and the way it is executed, the liberal policies fit too well and are too dependent on the capitalist infrastructure and the capitalist policy and capitalist agendas. So, instead of adopting, instead of adopting old, obsolete, and incomplete assessments from Malcolm X and liberalism, I was going to get into Dr. King and liberalism, but I'm way over time. 
instead of doing that, I, this is what I propose we do. We take the liberal positions of individual rights, individual autonomy, rights of the disabled, political correctness, rights of gender nonconforming people, the rights of women, the rights of youth, the rights of uh, religious and secular rights. We take those liberal positions and integrate them into the radical left. We embrace them. We acknowledge the necessity of them. You got black people out here that are food insecure and got black liberationists attacking food stamps and welfare. We got black people who are out here housing insecure and black people freedom fighters talking about uh, uh, um, fuck hood and, and, and the hood and housing. You got black people out here with underfunded, dilapidated, rodent infested public schools trying to and swindling the black community. Swindling the black community out of almost a million dollars with the false promises of a private school. When black people and our educational system, our landlot system, a lot of black communities adaptations to oppression are a lot of the foundations to a lot of these policies we attack today. Small landlots, public and free education. So black people stop attacking liberalism. Start attacking capitalism. Start attacking conservatism. Start attacking, start attacking false liberalism. Stop, start attacking those who try to marry liberalism with capitalism. Or who try to advance liberalism under capitalism. Or, or before you do any of that, just go look up the goddamn definition of liberal and liberalism. And then go look up the assessments of the various manifestations of liberals and liberalism. Look around the organizations and look at the public figures we respect. Look at our historical figures and see where they, what they advocated for falls on the political spectrum from liberal to conservative. So we should really be talking about the most relevant thing. The problem with the parties, the, the Republican and Democratic Party, is not because one is liberal and one is conservative. It's because they're both capitalist. They're both uh, white hegemonists. They're both militarist. And even the liberals within the, the, the Democratic Party, Zionist, militarist, capitalist, and even the conservatives, the fascists, I always say it is intellectually lazy to assert that there is no difference between the Democrats and the Republican Party. That is not a conclusion that should lead anyone to say one is bad and one is good. I always point out the fact that white people not only study our differences, they seek to enhance. White people have in scholarly studies on the differences between rural Negroes and city folk. Between religious blacks and secular blacks. And when they look at religious blacks, they say, how do the, 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 the black Mormons and the black uh, Methodists differ from the Baptists? You will only find the most ignorant, uneducated, and powerless white people say, all oh, niggers are the same. All oh, them Asians are the same. All these Chinese people. The ignorant white people will look at a Honduran, a Dominican, a Mexican, a Venezuelan, a Puerto Rican, all the Mexicans. But the scholarly, colonial, oppressor, capitalist white people understand the distinction. An ignorant white racist will be like, look at a Filipino, look at an Indonesian, look at a Korean, look at a Japanese, look at a Mongolian, oh, they're a bunch of Chinese. But the white racist in the State Department, in the United Nations, in the uh, conservative think tanks, they understand the distinctions. 
And black people who seek liberation will look at liberalism, will look at conservatism, look at the white people who adopt those identities, will look at the Democratic Party and understand the various factions within the Democratic Party will understand the Congressional Black Caucus and the Progressive Caucus and the and the difference between the DNC and the DLC. They will look at the right-wing reactionaries, will look at the Republicans and look at the various, the funding and how the funders versus the constituents, look at the log cabin Republicans, look at the, uh, what they call the Lincoln Group, look at the various factions, they look at the anti-Semites and the Zionists within the Republicans. If we really about freedom, if we really about posing a challenge to our oppressors, we will not, oh, just white people or just conservative, just. Revolution is an intellectual endeavor. Revolution is an intellectual endeavor. And if we don't comprehend the ideologies and we construct proper policies based on intellectual analysis and sober analysis, We, all the weapons, all the money, all the unity in the world, we can have unity. It will not serve us. So it's getting frustrating. In every election season, I get very frustrated because of all these people who are not even worthy, who couldn't pass a fifth grade civics class, want to come up with a, 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 what do they say? A contract for black America. Want to talk about they don't care about us. Want to talk and give black people political strategy. When your ultimate solution for us is divine intervention. And a predatory cult leader as our salvation. And y'all don't even listen to Malcolm. Y'all listen to this rhetoric that he was spewing in 63. And y'all ignore what he just said two, three years later. Even Malcolm was like, I realized the error of my ways. I wish I hadn't pointed so many people in the direction. He said, my house was firebombed by the fruit of Islam, and I trained most of the brothers in that group. I've made a grand error, and we won't let Malcolm X go beyond that error. We want to lock Malcolm X in the era of history that makes us comfortable. It feels good. I wish it was as simple as that. I wish it was as simple as honest conservatives and deceitful liberals. I wish it was that simple, but if it was that fucking simple, we'd be free already. And we got so many so-called black freedom fighters that are anti-liberalism. That want to repress us to free us who think we the more repression, the more strict hierarchies, the more reactionary policies. Make women stay in the kitchen, put the man back at the head of the family, give every man a gun, give every black man his own business. And black people put all our greenbacks in a bank. And everything they suggest that will free us leaves us right within the box of European, Western geopolitics and, 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 and international capitalism. And you might have a few more cars under capitalism. You might have a dependent, silent, traditional woman under capitalism, but you're still fucking under capitalism. You know, so go and read the whole thing of what Malcolm X said. And take what Malcolm X said in his speech in 1963, two years before the same man he was calling most honorable and calling our salvation before that man created the atmosphere that led to his death. Go read the whole thing and then. Look at his uh, his condemnation of liberals and his damn near complimentary position on conservatives. Read it in that context. At the time Malcolm X gave this speech, Malcolm X was a conservative. He was a social, theological, political conservative. And I'll tell you something else. I'll tell you something else. Why, Malcolm X went all over this country calling the white man the devil and was able to maneuver relatively freely. But when he made his hajj to Mecca, when he started meeting with international leaders and he broke with the cult and he became a true Pan-Africanism, he didn't survive much long after that. It wasn't his affiliation with the nation 
that made him a threat. It was his break uh, uh, with the nation and his teaching that made him a threat. Because the nation's still here, but Malcolm ain't. And I know y'all don't like hearing this. But the very speech y'all using to say, well, liberals are bad and conservatives, at least they bad, but they honest. The same man saying that our only solution. So why why you listen to the to the to the bottom half of the speech and not the top half when it's all tied together? Liberalism and conservatism both have their role. The problem with the two major parties is not that one is liberal and one is conservative. The problem with the two major parties and the reason we must stand in, 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 in principled opposition to the two major parties. Man, this little gnat. That we must stand in opposition to the two major parties is not because they're liberal, but because they are capitalist. Because they are white hege hegemons. I already listed militarism because they put the economy over the ecology and they're willing to hyper exploit the economy to collapse in order to preserve the economy that's the problem with the democratic party our problem with the democratic party is not that it's a liberal party that is not our problem our problem with the democratic party is that it exploits and falsely claims to put forward liberal policies because we want liberal policies we do not want conservatism and because liberalism is being attacked and eroded we are forced or out of necessity to move to radicalism to revolutionism but if you are a right-wing radical if you are a right-wing revolutionary if you think that because this party calls for the rights of women the rights of the gays the the uh, welfare health care and housing and food stamps if you think well there are evil wicked party joe biden at the same time he is advancing genocide and i gotta be specific i have to say the palestinian genocide because when i say advancing genocide there is a genocide currently going on on every populated landmass on the face of this earth And every now and then the white media will go to one of its genocides and say, oh, let's let's bring this one to the fore. Let's bring this one to the front. The the genocide against African people in this United States is happening. The genocide against Native Americans is happening. There is a genocide going on in Haiti. And look up the definition of genocide. It does not mean ex mass extermination. Go look at the Geneva. And I'm going off a of white folks definition of genocide that they gave to themselves. I, I go off of the limitations they put on themselves. Right now in Brazil, there's a genocide, multiple genocides happening. There was one man that was a member of the last member of one nation a tribe just died last. They called him the man in the hole. The, 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 the Portuguese, the conquistadors that y'all like to call Latino for some reason, the fucking European conquistadors who still run that country went into the, the, the forest and found an uncontacted nation of people that numbered in the thousand. And because they had some palm and they had some lumber and some shit they wanted, they slaughtered them all the way down to one person. And when it was down to one man, they figured they say, OK, we'll have a no contact protection. They called, look him up. They called him the man in the deep hole. And he was the last surviving member of his community, of his tribe of his nation, and he just died in 2022. I don't have a name for him because they never learned his name. And all he would do, he lived in, in, in the Amazon and he would go from place to place sleeping every night because he was just waiting his whole life for almost 20 years living in absolute solitude. But that's just not media work. There are genocides in Asia right now to this day. The, the, the population of Iraq and Afghanistan are still dealing with depleted uranium. There is a mass starvation from Syria to, to Somalia, even in, Af in, in, in in Eritrea, Ethiopia, whatever they over there, Tigray region. There's a famine going on there. There's a major genocide ongoing in the Congo that is being facilitated by black conservatives, the honest conservatives, the black conservative government of Rwanda, Kagame, Obama's homie. Right now, there are mass killings and mass graves that have been unaccounted for in Libya. 
There is a genocide right in the fucking uh, 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 straits where people, thousands of people every year are literally left to drown trying to take uh, uh, tugboats and fucking inner tubes from, from, from Libya to, to Greece or Libya to, to Italy and the Italian Coast Guard, the Greeks Coast Guard are, 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 are not allowing people to, and there are certain uh, liberals who are getting on their boats rowing out to try to rescue these Africans and these Syrians, these Yemenis trying to rescue, and that is genocide. But the genocide of the hour, the genocide of the hour is 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 Palestine, and I ain't hating on the Palestinians. I mean, if if if, if the white cameras are on you, utilize it to the best of your ability. But there are multiple genocides ongoing right now. And a lot of people who go online, free Palestine, they don't pay attention to the, 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 the genocide happening right in their backyard. And I do give the Palestinian credit throughout their struggle from the civil rights movement to the Rodney King rebellion to the Black Lives Matter movement, the Palestinians have articulated their solidarity. And they're very much aware of when, when, when we outside of the Zionist atrocities articulate our awareness for what that's worth. But I digress. We need to reclaim liberalism, liberal ideas, liberal philosophies, liberal policies. And we need to make sure that those same lib liberal policies are present within our organizations. I've been worked with and been a member of a lot of black organizations claiming they want liberation and revolution for society. But internally, they're extremely conservative. They're reactionary internally. They can make revolution in the world, but don't make revolution in their own homes. So anyway, I guess I, I, I'm way over time. So uh, yes, I endorse liberalism. I endorse liberalism. And I practice and embrace liberalism. And I'm not going to let the goddamn Democrats or any of these uh, 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 reactionary crackers take that. The principles and values of liberalism were present within our culture. It wasn't on accident. Where the fuck you see an accident? I said what I said. Anyway, I shared the link. Questions, comments, criticisms. I know it's late as hell. And, uh... My problem is I, I was talking because I was waiting on Skip. For some reason, Skip couldn't get the uh, link. Let me see. Yeah, I guess it's best he ducked this show. Oh, well, my big homie, my big OG ripped the crit. I don't know what. Uh, this is my day one homie. Rip the crit. What's up, man? Anyway, I guess I questions, comments, criticisms. None. All right. Everybody had a little something to say. I'm sorry. I know how hard it is. I know how hard it is walking around feeling so. I know how hard it is because we don't want. OK, Dre. What's up, Dre? What's that a good brother? Peace to you once oh. again. Appreciate um, you. Just want to say directly last time, my apologies for direct for derailing the conversation. That's um, all right. And then I'll actually ask this part later because it's, it's been a lot of time on it, but um, I think I have a better way of understanding your philosophy on um, that term. But are there any texts out there that you would recommend for a grounding in the ideology that you would, I don't want to say prefer, but that you would like to see advanced? Uh... In in terms of my ideology or liberalism, not, no, no, I'm, I'm moving. I'm sorry, I'm not. I'm not moving past. I'm going back to the concept of we need to establish an ideology for revolution. Oh, 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 yeah. Um, well, let me think. That's a good question because 
you know, it's not really any one text that I use right. to kind of st structure and reinforce my ideology. But I read Amos Wilson mm -hmm. and his teachings. So you look at the falsification of African consciousness. Okay. Um, and um, Africa versus the New World Order. Mm. Okay. And even even though it's not a specific book, but um, the uh, black on black violence, black self annihilation in service to to uh, white supremacy. So mm -hmm. Amos Wilson, Dell Jones, and everybody. Yeah. Time I mentioned Dell Jones, I have all his books here, except for somebody stole my copy for blacks only. Okay. But I have all the other books and um, Culture Bandits, Volume One, Two, and Three. Mm -hmm. Black Holocaust 2000. Um, what else? And believe it or not, and people are not going to believe that I said this, um, but Molefi Asante, we bumped heads. We had an opportunity to have a discussion, and it was not very good. But the mm -hmm. Afrocentric idea, probably prior to reading the Afrocentric idea, I was more of a traditional liberal. Like, okay. we all come together, but... It really introduced me to the concept of African centeredness. So the Afrocentric idea, um, the books by, um, um, it's because I'm trying to go back to the early, early books. Oh, okay. like when I first started developing my ideology, um, Naeem Akbar, breaking the chains yeah. of, 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 of psychological slavery. Um, the autobiography of, of Malcolm X. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, even though it's a nonfiction, it's historical fiction, um, things fall apart. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the joys of motherhood. The joys <laughs> of motherhood, okay. Really uh, shape my concept. And another author who I appreciate, who is a black conservative. That's okay. the thing. He's actually a, one of the few black conservatives. Well, I don't know if he would call himself a conservative, but he is, whether he wants to uh, admit it or not. But um, Chinwezu, okay. all of his books, The okay. West and the ref Rest of Us, Decolonizing the African Mind, France Fanon, but mm -hmm. don't read The Anatomy of Female Power. Do not read it, you said. Don't read that one. Okay. okay. You're not read it. Yo, yo, I've already gotten in trouble. Thanks. I have to hide that book from my wife. I understand. I <laughs> but everything else about Chumezu, I fully endorse and fully stand behind, but I think he's a black conservative. So those are just some books and some authors. But really, my ideology evolves. It's been evolving. So right. if you met 2000 Bro Diallo, I was probably mm -hmm. more on some Umar shit. You know, yeah. these women got to uh, submit and these gays are trying to infiltrate and uh, feminize and all that bullshit. Right. So uh, 2000 Bro Diallo or, or, or there was times when, you know, I was with uh, armed guerrilla insurgency and sleeping with a gun under my pillow and with a lot of these veterans out here, you know, training for 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 the race war. So yeah. I have been evolving and mm -hmm. that's why I'm able to find when black people are reactionary or, or not fully sussed out in their intellectual development. I tend to stick with them because people stuck with me. Right. And like I said, I've been around before, you know, when I was early on, like I'd be at home and like Dell Jones would give me a call and he would just break shit. So elders and the old heads would really just like be there for me. So um, I'm not quick to dismiss people. I might mock people, make fun and dis and, 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 but I don't, kick people to the curb because i understand this is a hard thing because i don't mm. care you could be a 20 year old african you're still a product of a, over 100 years of intense doctrination it starts yeah. in the womb you yeah. know yeah. so yeah. i hope that helps it did it did and uh, i'm gonna call back next time that and just to preface it it's so i'm assuming at one time you used the word you term white supremacy and my question was how did you go from that term to white hegemon and just that I, that, that breakdown of that thinking of how that's the incorrect term that we need to go. So if well, I, I actually, I, I, I always, when I was young, my father mm -hmm. used to write me letters from prison. My father was in prison for most of my childhood and he used to write me these long letters and he converted to Islam, but he, you know, had pretty much radical politics and he would write me these letters. So even he would talk about, I don't know, 
I guess I'll say it just to quote him, he would be like these pecker woods, these hongies, mm. crackers. He would always talk about black white folks in a demeaning way. So even right. as a young child, I never really had a concept of white, white people being supreme. Mm -hmm. I always knew that what they got was unjust. Right. So right. I didn't start saying white supremacy till I started reading uh, Francis Cress Welsing mm -hmm. and Dr. Nellie Fuller. Right. And, and with, with, with the cold system concept and even Amos Wilson. And, and, and so in the, in my early ages, I had no concept, but as I started getting more formal schooling in, in, in black ideology and black politics and black history, that mm -hmm. was just the term, even though it never right. sat right with me. Right. So I was thinking if they aren't Supreme, it just doesn't fit. When I look up the word Supreme and concepts of Supreme and how mm -hmm. black carry in the context so yeah. i would say white supremacy just so that people could comprehend what i was saying even though i right. didn't speak it so right if i'm talking if you're talking about oh, francis Cress welsing or, mm -hmm. or, or, mm -hmm. or the code system concepts or yeah. areas of human relation mm -hmm. those authors would say supremacy right. dale jones would mm -hmm. say white supremacists yeah but i was like you know we can't it's just it's been here too long and okay. I just decided, even though it was more convenient to say, because you won't believe how much pushback I got when I said, stop calling them Supreme. I mean, black folks was fighting me tooth and nail, cursing me out, denouncing me just like they are when I'm saying that we should embrace liberalism and not leave it to white folks to be the liberals. Right. We need to be the true liberals. But yeah, yeah. Um, I got a lot of pushback. Black people right. was part of their fundamental identity to see white mm -hmm. people as the Supreme. Yeah. And uh, my, I, I am with you with everything you're saying. I don't, I don't use it as a term of thinking they're supreme. To me, it's their mindset. They believe they are such that they do these certain things. So what I use, I use the framework work of they, they believe that they are supreme and thus they do all these actions. And so I don't use it. I know they're not supreme and that by no means. And the same way I want to ask you, if you wouldn't use supreme, which I agree in terms of how it's we're using it in terms of they think that we think they are supreme they're, they're not mm -hmm. i think it's their mentality then why do we continue to use the word elite well i think elite uh that's just from a class analysis okay you know you can but i kind of try to be specific i will say the economic elite or the political again, elite. like as you say about how you wouldn't call cancer elite as a killing mechanism how do we use the term like they're economically scoundrels or like some other term that it, you, you see what I'm trying to get to like the parallels of if we're going to move away from supremacy because they're not supreme then should we also retire the term elite I can get with that I, I okay. often call them parasites yeah, I, I've gone right. to call them the para instead of the elite class I call them the parasite class gotcha. or okay. even the dependent class so I'm with you on that but yeah. like I said I'm struggling. You can. I, I will rock with you without calling the the these parasites elites. But I, you say I've been bumping heads for for half a decade now, mm -hmm. telling me I'm wrong to to refuse to call white folks supreme. And, and I, I don't say no. and I don't say supremacist. I say white aggressor. I'm with you. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I don't say you. white privilege. I say white pathology. Right. So yeah. It's just. I mean. It's it's you. But like I said go out there and i agree and i will start rocking with you and say no they're not elite they're parasites yeah yeah and see okay. the pushback you get understood yeah i just i don't um last thing i'm sorry i think what was it the white to me the white pathology i would describe it as supremacy they view themselves as such that don't matter so what if, if, no, if your you? local if your local homeless person says listen i'm a billionaire okay you would still call them a bum I won't call them, but I see your point though. I do see your point, but they do, but, but those wait, things, wait, 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 though, okay. But no, okay. okay. I'm saying, yes, just because somebody say we got black people out here saying they're Native Americans, right? Do you call them Native Americans? I call them Africans, so I'm gonna but they believe it, right? They call but, themselves, but that's indigenous. Like indigenous. do you call them indigenous? The five percenters say they are God, they're arm, leg, leg, arm, head. The, the, the five percenters say, I am God. And my woman, do you call them gods? Do you think they're gods? No, but I, I do think the difference is that 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 parasitic, that parasitic group that has the perspective they are supreme have the ability to enact that reality upon us. Yes. 
Yeah, that's and that's what I'm, and that's what I'm, that's, but that's what I'm saying. But here's the thing: uh -huh. Would you call R. Kelly a sexual supremacist? No, no, no. But I have a, I have a but he has the I, ability to. He used yes. for for his sexuality. He was able to impose his his desires right. on right. unwilling people. Do, but so I, is but, he not a sexual supremacist? Here's my, here's my here's my rejoinder. It would be: huh? Does he view himself as such? Does I he? Say, like, right. I would think he. So would. he does. So what yeah. you gonna call him? Good point. No, what would no, you no, call no, R. Saying, Kelly? If R. Kelly, Kelly came to you and said, yeah. "I'm a sexual supremacist," are I'll you going to be like, mentality. "Yeah, R. Kelly and his sexual supremacy"? I would say that's his pathology. I would say that's his pathology. What would you say, What would you call him? A rapist. But he 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 believes he's a sexual supremacist. Yeah. So do so do they? They think they're white. What would you call him? A rapist. Even though he calls himself a supremacist. Yeah. I don't like. I don't call. So they believe they're supreme. Right. What they believe they're beautiful, right? Do you call them beautiful? The beautiful people? Not at all. I call us the beautiful people. So they believe they're supreme. Therefore, yes. we are obligated to call them supreme. No, no, no. I'm calling them their pathology white supremacy. Their their outlook is white. That's what I'm saying. It's on, what they so you call their pathology white supremacy? Yes. Is that accurate? No, no. Nor what are they? They are a parasites, aggressors. Greed. And what leads an individual mm -hmm. to have the desire to be identified as supreme? What drives that? Ego. We all have egos. I have an right. ego. I have no desire to be supreme over anyone else. But all our egos are different, though, right? So it's not ego. Then what do you? Okay, I'm, I'm going to you. What do you think? It, what, what is it to you? Then? I what don't know. That? See, here's the thing. I think it's pathology. I don't say Agreed. white privilege. I say white pathology. I right. say it's white hegemony or even white domination. I'm with you. But you don't have to be supreme. What are white people actually supreme in? Nothing. Or evil, but that's another term. You're saying like, I, I'm with you. Not, they're not, I agree. We're not saying they're not supreme, but their outlook of we have to be on top. We have to control. That's we pathological. That's yeah, pathological. That's their, that's and their, even their, their own scholars, yep. even their own psychologists, sociologists, mm -hmm. anthropologists, Mm -hmm. social scientists mm -hmm. they all have reached the same conclusion as me and it's been easier for me to get white people to stop saying white supremacy mm -hmm. and white privilege than it has been for black people here's my why I, I caution against that currently is because if i was talking to a, like a brother and i was trying to say the white domination they can make they may interpret it as that there's a battle they can win of whether well, i gotta dominate that person like no 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 their outlook, their agenda is aggression, domination. I don't understand. I don't understand what you're saying. I just, all I'm saying is that I think their viewpoint, how they look at humanity in the globe is of a dominating so supreme. What? Hmm? So what? So what? But that's, city. That's, I'm saying that's, a, that's their city, right? That's I agree term. with you on that. But we're, we're yeah. saying you're mm -hmm. talking about what they do and I'm talking about what they are. And I'm saying what they do is based on how they think they are. That's all. Okay. Yeah, same, that's, that's what I'm saying. Same, same I'm talking thing. about the appropriate label for who and what they are and what they are doing. Mm -hmm. They're white aggressors who believe they are supreme. Okay. Yeah, well, who wants all. to say all that shit? You can't say that every time. <laughs> I'm with you. But that's, and that's, that's where you we are. You're going to be out here in con casual conversation and say white aggressors who think they are supreme. You're going to be saying that instead of just saying white hegemony and white domination? Why can't I say they're white supremacists? Because it's it, because of the connotation. Understood. And Who's that's the supreme that. basketball that. player. Who is the supreme basketball player in your point of view? I, it, I don't, we might be at one o'clock, and I don't want to do that. I think Curly. Just I, one. Okay. Who LeBron, is LeBron, a LeBron, supreme, LeBron, not the LeBron, supreme? LeBron. I'm not about to, who. LeBron. LeBron. Mm -hmm. LeBron is a supreme basketball player, right? Let's say that every time LeBron went onto the field, he walked out on the field with automatic 15 points number one number two mm -hmm. the basketball hoop on his side is only eight feet off the ground instead of 10 feet agree number three there is a downward slope towards his side and an upward mm -hmm. slope towards the other side mm -hmm. number four all mm -hmm. the players on the opposing team got one leg play with one arm tied behind their back yep finally lebron mm -hmm. james is allowed to travel carry all that and 
carry a switchblade and a gun throughout the gun game. Right. And he had more points than anybody else every game. Would you say he's a su superior basketball player? Absolutely not. What would you call him? What if he thought it? Even though all these things, what if he thought in his mind and his heart right. and believed with all his heart yep. that yep. he was the supreme superior basketball player? Right. What would you call him? A lunatic. Okay. I'm with you. They're so, lunatic. Okay. But this is very clear to us. We don't call cancer cellular supremacy. We don't call you. rapists sexual supremacists. I'm with you. I'm we with don't you. call thieves mm -hmm. economic supremacists or right. material supremacists. Agreed. There's no dispute. We don't even call colonizers territorial supre supremacists. Right. And here's one thing. Mm -hmm. Even white people are comfortable using the terms white privilege and white supremacy mm -hmm. because the suggestion is white people are truly superior mm -hmm. and we should try to negotiate with them to not exercise their supremacy right. and we even have black movements and black mm -hmm. leaders out here arguing for white supremacy right so just like privilege if someone has a privilege mm -hmm then the logical thing to say they should share that privilege or allow me the same privilege. So if they, if they are truly supreme, the best way to get through, if you want to be a great basketball player, you would follow LeBron James's path, mm -hmm. his fitness regimen, his training regimen, his techniques. Mm -hmm. If, if LeBron James is privileged, you would want that. So calling shit, supreme and privilege leads black people to mistakenly seek integration and equality. So but nobody I, wants to be pathological. Right. So that's why I, that's why I, I kind of step away from it. I, my fear is that if we don't use that term, we may fall, like we say, like you're saying, we would like try to try to appease or become that. And I use it from a fear a standpoint of like they're they're delusional. It's a delusion, essentially. That's all. You're not calling it white delusion, though. I would, my, I would call you it. You use all these appropriate words yeah. to define white supremacy, but you mm -hmm. don't use it in the label. So you can say white delusion, yeah, I'm white technology, yeah. white hegemony, because most of the time we're talking about white supremacy, we're talking about in the geopolitical context. Yes. We're talking about imperialism, capitalism, militarism. Right. And nobody truly uses supremacy in that context. They use words like hegemony. Mm hmm and in position mm -hmm. so it's an obsolete term okay you don't how often do you hear supreme or supremacy in any other context besides white folks nobody really uses that for except for that overpriced tacky ass fashion line and white people's committing daily atrocities those are right. only two times i hear it's not even yeah. a word we hear and catch it's an obsolete term that doesn't properly define or describe what they've done because even the advantages if you would define it that way that they have they got through deception mm -hmm. through trickery yep through misdeeds mm -hmm. and most things that we genuinely define as supreme usually are got it from their merits from ability from skill i see what you're saying so you're more focused this on the is an word. ongoing debate i see what you're saying i don't know why Stop using flowery language. Mm -hmm. And the main thing, if your oppressor starts using, you got white people, like, I'm a white supremacist. Mm -hmm. it, can't, it can't. So listen, they dominate. And you can describe in detail how they came to dominate and the techniques mm -hmm. and tactics they used to dominate. Mm -hmm. They exercise hegemony and you can argue about it, but they're not supreme. Agreed. Agreed. Delusional. So don't call it that, regardless of what the fuck they think. Their thoughts aren't yours. Their their their, their conclusions and their their, their uh, uh titles, you ain't got to carry it. They think they're supreme and they think we're inferior. Right. So you call yourself inferior? By no means. But they think it. They think it. They really right. think. It. Even right. so, the, this is the, they suspect I'm inferior. We don't call ourselves inferior, even though they think it. So why call them superior, even though they think it? I think that's where we kind of. I'm not. I'm not calling. I'm not calling them su supreme. So I think, but just their, just their pathology. is all. I just described. Also, white I just pathology. Described. Yeah. White pathology. Yeah. I'm white with pathology. it. Pathology. Yeah. White okay. pathology. We can meet there. My man. Hoarding resources. White pathology. There we go. Nuclear uh, decimation. White pathology. White pathology. 
right? Yeah. Persecution, racism, white pathology. I'm Hoarding the wealth, exploiting the wealth of the laborers, white pathology. Major homelessness crisis, mm -hmm. even though there is a, a glut of housing infrastructure, white pathology. There we go. I'm with okay. you now. Yep. We're in Thank agreement. you, brother. You're Always not going to say white it. supremacy or white supremacist. If a white person is attacking another non, a, a non-white person based on their uh, a minority or non-white status, that is not a white supremacist. That is a white aggressor. There we go. Thank you. All right, my brother. Have a good night, right. man. Always appreciate it. All right. Okay. Uh, Isaac, sorry for the wait. We way over time, and I'm about to get in trouble. Isaac, <laughs> yeah, hey, bro, what time is it where you at? Uh, it's 8.07 where I'm at. Yeah. A.M. or P.M.? Uh, P.M. Yeah. Oh. P.M. Yeah, we were two hours uh, behind. behind. Oh, you. that's it? Yeah, two hours. Yeah. All right. What's up, my passport, bro? <laughs> well, uh. Um, you got any submissive traditional women over there? Uh, not, not my way, no. <laughs> <laughs> He's not a passport, bro. Um, <laughs> no, I had, um. <laughs> I had uh, relatively two questions. I'll kind of keep it short because I, I do. I, I do. Know you you got to go. Um, one is I want to know how or if you can explain the importance or if there is an importance to the terminology, new terminology that is being used to describe uh, the actions of, say, white individuals, au fait, uh, marshmallow minions is what I like to call them. Um, they um like white fragility uh, uh caucasity like these types of terms and if they have any type of important value to yeah. to us so that that would be the first question the second question uh would be um and it has nothing to do with the topic at all it's are you going to be watching the revamped x-men uh series hell yeah <laughs> hell yeah <laughs> x-men 97 that's my shit hell yeah i'm gonna watch this shit out of that boy hey boy let me tell you something. Yes. The answer is yes. So, I mean, that's the most important thing. But as far as yes, mockery is a necessity. If you look at any resistance movement, revolutionary movement, uprising, whether you're fighting against a czar or, or, or a, uh, a tyrannical dictator or fighting against um, some theological or religious overlord or theocracy you'll find that most successful organizations and movements for resistance and liberation always engaged in mockery especially when it's mockery what they call it ascending violence when the people who are downtrodden and put upon begin to belittle the overwhelming power and force of those who attack us because they always mock us you know, so yes, there is a place for those terms and, and for those belittling and for that mockery, uh, calling the police pigs and things of that nature or a cornerstone in transforming the consciousness. And believe you me, it cuts deeper and hits harder when when Elon Musk got booed, when that Uncle Tom, uh, Dave Chappelle brought him up on stage, that shit hits hard. You know. And so, yes, I do believe in the mockery and, and belittling of the elites as we exercise all levels of respect and sensitivity when talking about uh, people who are our class peers and those who fall beneath us on the hierarchy. So any level of attack, psychological or physical attacks on those who are above us in the hierarchy is necessary, welcomed, healthy and uh should be commended uh one last question i know i'm gonna i'm gonna try and keep it to to five seconds um if you could uh if, if you were one villain out of the dc universe to describe how you have been dealing with the uh religion topic on bpm which and i'm i'm i hope i don't get in trouble for this before to come to my podcast but which villain would you describe yourself uh if if you if you could uh <laughs> why why i gotta pick a villain uh, okay i'll it's, answer uh, i'll answer <laughs> but i'm just curious mercurius okay you're not gonna tell me 
if I had to be one of the villains, is Apocalypse. It, it, it could be a hero. It could be. A, it could be. A hero. I, I, I'll pick a villain. <laughs> I would be Apocalypse. And I like Apocalypse because he's a mockery. His very character is a very mockery of uh, religion because his name is Apocalypse, which all the Abrahamic religions talk about the apocalypse. And he has the four horsemen of the apocalypse. So he is a mockery of established religion. And uh, he seeks to bring about uh, the ultimate victory of the persecuted mutants, even though I don't like his eugenics position. But, you know, I was going to say the blob because he's immovable <laughs> once he's set on a position <laughs> he can't be moved but uh it just he's not in spain he don't look as good in spandex whereas apocalypse got the abs if i if i must be a superhero and i can't get abs what's the point so i would say the i i would have the blob's power of being immovable and unshakable once i'm established on a strong foundation but i want a apocalypse physique <laughs> does that work well, it, it works me personally i thought it was dark side i thought you're gonna choose dark side he's just... dc <laughs> i said dc i didn't say marvel i said DC. oh i thought yeah, you know yeah, what yeah, when you DC. mentioned 97 <laughs> yeah when you mentioned marvel 97 or x-men night my mind is locked all i'm thinking about is x-men and I can tell you, I, I watched it bootleg uh, via a bootleg website because I don't got the, the funds for that. <laughs> uh, it's a good, it's 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 good, it, and I think I think you're you're gonna like it, especially if you. Did like you really laugh. say DC? Because I didn't. Yeah, I think I if I if I didn't, maybe you know, maybe uh maybe I did, but I I swear I said DC simply because I was I, in my mind I was thinking Dark Side um you know and the the band of individuals that, that he has around him uh you know granny um and a bunch of other his minions yeah you know. I, no i wouldn't be no dark side in the anti-life <laughs> equation my wife always says you know europeans they they are the anti-life equation i wouldn't be <laughs> you know who i'd be you know who i like i like the gritty villains i don't i don't i, I like like captain cold trickster you know, like the Rogues Gallery. Would you be Polka Dot Man? <laughs> I'd be Polka Dot Man from the Suicide Squad movie. Yeah. <laughs> without the without the mental issues, but beyond that, uh, yeah, but not not the comic book version. But I like Captain Cold. You know, he's very practical. He loves his sister, and I love my sister, my big sisters. You know, and so. I would like to be Captain Cold, and uh, I like the fact that he's pretty much, you know, he's not even a super villain. He's not super smart, he, and he stole his technology, <laughs> and he's able to throw down with major, you know, demagogues, and he's basically uh, a, a man of the people. And he's only, he doesn't have any grand schemes of world complex. He's just trying to get some money to feed his daughter like Biggie Smalls on the corner, <laughs> just trying to get enough money <laughs> to feed my kids. So I, I more relate to those type of villains that are basically criminals, but not global conquest or some high minded idea. And don't even support like chaos, like the Joker. I like I like Captain Cold and the rogues gallery. So I'd be Captain Cold. If if I if I did have to choose a villain uh, for myself or um, it, it would probably have to be Baron Zemo. Um, but that's Marvel. The Nazi. No, you not. Bugging. No. You're no, bugging. You're bugging. <laughs> what a! I, and listen, I, he's a freaking Nazi. But all right, we'll leave on that note. You be a Nazi uh, uh, ally of Hitler, okay? That's all. And I do the great. <laughs> Oh. No, um, no, even I also Joker wanted... doesn't like even Joker doesn't like Zemo and the Nazis. He's like, I'm a lunatic, but I'm not a racist. <laughs> no, I'm talking about the Zemo from what would be considered like the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Nah, like, nah, he's, nah, he's, nope, nope, he's nope, nope. Nah, they whitewashed him. They, no, <laughs> I don't let y'all whitewash Zemo. But anyway, Vlad's been waiting. He's looking at us like we crazy. Vlad's waiting on us, and we talking. <laughs> so I appreciate you, bro. Yeah, I'll be hitting yeah, you I'll up. Check for... out the Indigenous Nightmare podcast. 
Yeah, thank you. I actually got a message uh, that some somewhere we are being used as far as the episode we did um, critiquing ADOS and FBA, FBA is being used as like an educational um, tool uh, for people to learn. So I just wanted for out there to put up, oh, put that out there. In, okay, yeah, I am doing my Joker put, thing. Putting putting out there in the ether, you know, you you know that there is an effort that you don't ha that you don't have in the community. You do um, because it's exhibited through, you know i.e. what i just told you so thank right. you again and, yeah um, and i'm sorry and let me take back the joke he's in a different time zone but he's, <laughs> he's saving up his money to go overseas to get a submissive <laughs> wife but he's still with us <laughs> all right bro all right you have a good one man <laughs> all right okay vlad you're gonna close us out sorry about the wait man he started getting into geek shit you're muted you're muted can you hear me now? I hear you now. What's up, bro? We okay. way over time. This is the longest show. I, I know. I, <laughs> I know. I know. At this time, you know, at this time, I just want to say hi to you and, and say how much I appreciate your work, man. And uh, you, you bring so much clarity and, and, uh, and, uh, and, you know, to your analysis and all of that. We appreciate a lot and we have learned a lot from you. Uh, me and a couple of friends, you know, and uh, I did have a couple of questions, but I'm I'm going to leave them from another for another time. Yeah. I'm from Cuba, and in uh, right. and uh, you know, uh, we black people are struggling down there too. Yeah. And um, Cuba's like, not a socialist utopia. <laughs> uh, yeah, in a way, but oh, not, right. thank you. In a way, but but no, not really. Not I mean. <laughs> I, I I'm, it's the the way I see it. The way I see it, they uh, they attack the uh, the class issue, but they, I, in my view, they didn't go far enough as to attack the the race issue, right? Yeah, and yeah. Uh, and um, and then we're we're still strugg struggling down there, you know. Um, and this is something I would like to at, at some point, and you know, at some point I would like to talk to you about and and hear your hear a little bit more of your perspective especially these days you know we're having a lot of issues down there and a lot of protests and all of that and there's a lot of um uh right wing uh, uh rhetoric and a lot of right wing shit going on you know so that's our concern yeah. um but again it doesn't have to be now right now i just want to say hi to you and, and say how much i appreciate your work i appreciate you too man reaching yeah. out and and uh let me know and i do look forward to that conversation so we'll be back i'll, I'll be back i'll be back <laughs> right, i appreciate you bro yeah take care man take care okay uh weren't some of the noi's teaching help malcolm change his destructive behavior no go back and read the autobiography of malcolm x and he names the man who actually started to turn him away from his addictions and help to awaken him before Malcolm X was already on the path to enlightenment and liberation before he was indoctrinated into the cult. So it's going to be a no for me, dog. And with that, I'm going to wish everybody a good evening. And this has been a marathon show. Shout out to Skip. Sorry if it's my fault. I'll take the blame that, that, that the link didn't work. And I'll try to figure out what the problem is. I ain't no nerd. I'm an alpha. I don't know this nerdy shit. But anyway, uh, see y'all Friday on Early Liberation and next Monday, uh, the Bodhi Alley broadcast.